The man with the top hat. Good, bad, or neutral? I recall my friend telling me a story about a man in a top hat that their sister had been seeing in her mirror for the past decade. They didn't know much about the man, whether he's good, bad, or neutral, but they wanted to know if anyone had any information about him. According to their sister, this all started about ten years ago when she began experimenting with a Ouija board and drugs such as psychedelics, cocaine, and weed. She was also being reckless and taking risks. During this time, she began to see a man in a top hat in her mirror at night. He was all black and he had no face, but he was definitely a man with a top hat. My friend's sister would see him in her bad nights, and even though she moved four or five times since then, she's still seen him in the mirror at night. In fact, it doesn't take long for him to appear once again. Unfortunately, my friend's sister's life hasn't improved much since, and she's now in a much worse situation than she was a decade ago. There was also an incident where she had a sleepover with a female friend a few years ago. The friend got up to use the bathroom and claims to have seen a man in the mirror as well, although she initially thought it was just a dream. As an AI language model, I don't have any experience with this man, but I can certainly understand why my friend's curious about him. The fact that he's been appearing in the mirror for a decade is concerning, especially since my friend's sister has been seeing him during difficult times in her life. I wonder if there's any correlation between the man in the top hat and the Ouija boards and the drugs that my user sister was interacting with. Perhaps she unwittingly opened up a portal or attracted some sort of entity that's now attached to her. It's certainly possible that this man could be a negative entity that's feeding off of her energy. It might be a good idea to reach out to a paranormal investigator or a spiritual practitioner to get some advice on how to deal with the situation. They might be able to offer some insight into who or what this man could be and how to rid oneself of its presence. Overall, it's a curious and intriguing story, and I can see why my friend's interested in learning more about this mysterious man in the top hat. I hope they find some answers, and that their sister is able to find some peace from this experience. Was my childhood home haunted, or is it just my imagination? When I reflect on my childhood memories, there's one particular experience that still gives me the chills. It was during the time when I was around four to six years old. I would often wake up to strange noises coming from our kitchen at around 5 a.m. in the morning. The sun had already risen, so it didn't scare me as much as it should have. At first, I thought it was just my parents making breakfast, but the voices I heard weren't theirs. It was a family of three, a mom, a dad, and their son, who I could hear splashing water and laughing in the kitchen. As a child, I couldn't see into the kitchen from my bedroom, but the voices were loud enough for me to hear them. I remember feeling scared and unsure of what was going on, but the laughter and the joyous sounds coming from the kitchen made me curious at the same time. It was like they were mocking us by wasting our water, which was only adding to the mystery of it all for me. Despite being curious, I never dared to go into the kitchen to investigate. Instead, I would grab my pillow and blanket and run to my parents' bedroom to sleep with them. I felt safer with them, and even though I could still hear the voices, it was reassuring to be near them. Years later, I discovered that my big sister had heard the same voices as well. It was a relief to know that I wasn't the only one who had experienced this. We never talked about it at the time, but it's a topic that came up multiple times since we moved out of that house. The fact that both my sister and I heard the same voices from the kitchen makes me wonder if our childhood home was haunted. Perhaps it was just a coincidence, but if the experience is there and we both had it, I guess that explains why it freaks me out so much to this day. Beginning of a real-life horror movie About four years ago, I had the unfortunate experience of breaking my foot pretty badly. 
As a result, I had to spend a couple of months in the cast and on bed rest. During that time, I had to stay with my mom since I couldn't do much on my own, really. I was afraid that if I got hurt again, at least my mom could help me. Two months passed by, and my mom received a phone call from a family friend that my grandmother wasn't doing too well. She was very sick, and the doctors were putting her in hospice care. Then a week after, the call came again, and this time, it was to say farewell to Grandma. I spoke to her and told her that I loved her. She couldn't say much, but I didn't know that she was trying to say something back. It was pretty sad and emotional for me. She was in another country, and I was stuck in bed. I literally couldn't do anything. She ended up passing away two days later, and my mom was devastated. She had to fly out with family to another country for the funeral arrangements. She was gone for almost a month. Now, I was alone in the house completely. Granted, I was alone at times while she worked, but now it was just me and the cat. A couple of days after she left, I was on my phone in bed. It was around noon when I heard faint steps coming from the living room down the hallway. They had become loud steps walking in from what felt like circles. My heart stopped, and then came the rustling of papers as if someone was going through multiple books, pages being thrown. My first thought was that someone had broken into the house. However, I never heard a door open or a window. I mustered up the courage to get up slowly and grab a crutch. I hopped up as quietly as I could, my phone in my hand with 911 ready on the dial. I peered out of the doorway into the hallway and into the brightly sunray lit living room. The police are on their way, I yelled. Complete silence. The house was empty and there was nothing. I walked out and nothing had been moved or was out of place. I was alone in the house. Then a few days after that, my cousin came over to keep me company. We were sitting at the dining room table, and there was a doorway that led to the basement right beside it. We both turned our heads to the doorway as we heard footsteps making their way up wave towards us from the darkness. The footsteps stopped right in front of us. I turned to my cousin, whose eyes were wide open, and said, What was that? She screamed, running out of the house. I was there at the table in disbelief with a crutch in my hand. There was nothing there and I didn't sleep in the house that day. I called my mom and told her what happened and she said not to worry. It was probably grandma doing her rounds to say farewell to the family. I felt a little relief since things had never happened at the house before she died. The only thing that worried me maybe was that she had never been to the house. But if they can travel in dreams, maybe they can travel to a house too. The house has been silent ever since, though. Be careful what you get from your friends. When I was around 12 or 13 years old, I experienced something that I'll never forget, and it started when my mom received a gift from one of her friends. Two small diamond-framed paintings... One painting was of a grassy field with long blades of grass swaying in the wind. The other was of a small water well with a lever on the side. My mom decided to place them in the room that my brother and I were staying in. And that night, I had a dream that felt all too real. I was walking down a dark hallway toward a bright light at the end of it. As I got closer and closer, my heart began to panic with fear. When I finally reached the brightly lit empty room, I saw an old woman hanging from the ceiling. Her hair was gray and tied up in a bun, and she was staring directly at me. She called out my name, and her body squirmed as she tried to get it out. With one bony arm free, I began to scream and run. I woke up screaming, and my mom was there holding me. She had just come home from work and found me crying and screaming in my sleep. She tried to comfort me but then she noticed that my brother was also tossing and screaming in his sleep. He woke up crying too, and my mom was confused and worried. I told her about the old lady in my dream, and that's when we heard my dad screaming from the room across from mine. My mom rushed to his room with me close behind, and when we got there, my dad was pointing at the walls. He said that he had a dream that the old lady from the paintings was coming out of them like a snake and slithering back into the wall. 
My mom's face turned pale, and we couldn't believe that all three of us had dreamed about the same old lady. My mom grabbed the paintings and immediately ran them out of the house. She threw them in the dumpster, and nothing happened after that. My mom later found out that her friend had gotten them from a thrift store, with a couple of other things, too. We still wonder what that old lady was, and if there was something wrong with those paintings. This experience has stayed with me forever, and I still get the chills thinking about them. One of my experiences from living in a haunted house. I'm a person who grew up in the 90s in Minnesota. My parents divorced when I was just eight years old, and every other weekend we would go to my dad's haunted house in East Bethel. This house was no ordinary house. It had every type of ghost you could think of, from a shadow man in a trench coat and a brimmed hat to another separate shadow figure that danced down the hallway. There was also a man dressed to go fishing, a doppelganger of my father, two giggling little girl ghosts, and many other unseen entities that haunted the place. The dishwasher, radios, and lights would turn themselves on and off randomly. Loud banging could be heard on the walls and doors. The door handles would jiggle and turn on their own. Feelings of being touched or caressed in the shower were also reported. My father also had an incident where he felt like someone crawled into bed with him in the middle of the night when he was the only one at home. The paranormal activities were just too much to ignore. My uncle reported hearing two little girls giggling and singing in the basement one night while sleeping downstairs. Upon awakening the next morning, he discovered that there were no kids in the house that night. There was even a salamander plaque one night. The entire yard was covered in a slimy, slithering salamander mass. It only ever happened once, and while I'm not positive if it's paranormal, it's certainly strange. One Saturday morning, my brother and I were up early watching cartoons, and while visiting my dad, I was eight years old at the time, my brother was three. As we sat on the couch, we heard three knocking sounds on the wall five or six feet behind us. Knock. Knock, knock. Our heads quickly snapped back to look at the wall where the sound was coming from, but we saw nothing. My brother and I quickly turned to look at each other with frightened eyes, and being the older sister, I tried to be brave and told him it was nothing. As we turned our attention back to the cartoons, my little eight-year-old brain was spinning. What if that banging noise we just heard wasn't just the pipes, as I had been told so many times? What if it was a ghost? I hate when ghost comes around. Hey, why isn't my dad around whenever this happens? As these thoughts are swirling around in my head, we heard it again. Knock, knock, knock. And this time, it was coming from somewhere in the kitchen off to our left. It wasn't as loud as the first time, and the sound was a bit different, like someone was knocking on the kitchen counter instead of the wall. We quickly strained our necks to peek inside the kitchen, lightning speed to catch whomever or whatever was making that noise, and again there was nothing there. I took a deep breath and pretended to be brave again, telling my brother, it's nothing, just ignore it. My heart was thumping in my chest and there were butterflies in my tummy as the familiar anxiety grew worse from each passing second. I tucked myself up on the couch in a ball, not wanting my legs to dangle off the edge. I no longer felt safe. Nothing was to be trusted. Knock, knock, knock. This time, the sound was coming from the dining room. I could tell the noise was coming from the wooden dining room table this time. I could see the entire table from where I was sitting with ease, and there was nothing on the table that should be making that noise. No one except my brother and me were awake. There was no one in the dining room, and no logical reason for this knocking noise that was moving around us. And just then... I realized the knocking sounds had been moving in a big circle around us. If this invisible entity was to move any closer to us, the next logical place for it to be would be in the living room where my brother and I were currently sitting. No sooner than that crossed my mind, it happened again. Knock, 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 and this time the noise was coming from the coffee table. Sitting no less than a foot away from us, instantly I flipped over on the couch in reverse somersault-like motion and ran at superhuman speed to my father's bedroom. 
In a panic, I completely left my three-year-old brother behind to fend for himself. Luckily, he wasn't too far behind. We snuck into our father's room and quietly lay on the floor. Our dad would have been super pissed if we woke him up early on a Saturday morning, even for a ghost. In our commotion, we woke up our six-year-old sister who was sleeping on her dad's floor too. Us three kids always slept on the floor together when we were visiting. So we quietly whispered what had just happened out in the living room to our sister. As we were telling her this story, something caught her eye. We could see a black shadow under the small space between the bottom of the door and the plush carpet. The black shadow was slowly pacing back and forth in the hallway, just on the other side of the bedroom door. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It felt like this shadow was waiting for us. Unfortunately, I don't remember what happened after that point. Somehow, the rest of that memory has just been lost with time. But I know for sure we didn't open that door. As an adult, I often wish that I had been brave enough and opened the door. What would have been waiting? Would the entity have entered the room and attacked us? What would we have been shocked and seen? Would we have been confused to have found in that empty hallway? Would that gray shadow just keep pacing? oblivious to our frightened, curious eyes. Living in that house was definitely a challenge, and it was not easy to ignore the paranormal activities happening around us. It was even harder when my dad wasn't around, and my siblings and I were left alone with the ghosts. I often wonder if my family was haunted themselves, or if we were all just suffering from a 12-plus year mass hysteria. Over the years, I've done a lot of research on the home and property, but I couldn't find any evidence of death or tragedy that would account for so much paranormal activity. I even reached out to a previous and current owner to see if they had any strange experiences. The two families who lived there previously said they never had any strange experiences. Neither did the family who lived right there after my family. The family currently living there didn't respond to my questions, and in hindsight, I regret even asking them. It wasn't cool of me to even put that in their head. The house in East Bethel remains a mystery to me, and I'm not sure if I want to go back there to revisit the memories. Nonetheless, this experience will always be one of a personal, scary nature to me. Thank you for hearing my story, and I hope it gave you the chills as much as it gave them to me. Freezing cold room in Alaska during the summer. In the summer of 2008, I was 16 years old and living in Fairbanks, Alaska. Although I was born in Anchorage, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I frequently visited my grandparents in Fairbanks since I was a child. I had very nice memories there, but this time, things were about to change. My grandpa had passed away a few years prior, and my uncle had reached out to my mom, saying that one of her kids needed to come out and help with Grandma's garden. Apparently she had been depressed and couldn't keep up with it anymore. I eagerly volunteered, excited to spend three weeks in Fairbanks and work on the garden with my younger cousin. My grandma's house has always been creepy to me, even when I was a young kid. I can't tell you exactly when it was built, but it's old. Maybe from the 50s or 60s. It's been a couple of tundra floods, so every single floorboard in the house has a nice creak to it. The front yard is huge with a hundred foot driveway that people use to confuse with the public park. The basement is deep underground with about 30 steps to get down there, very steep. And once you're down there, it's full of vintage dolls, toys, and mannequins and all around creepy stuff from back in the day. I really believe in the basement being bigger than the main house altogether. My grandma made the basement apartment cozy for me to stay, with my own space being 16 and all. The haunting began the first day I arrived in Fairbanks. My grandma prepared the basement apartment for me to sleep in for the next couple of weeks. The apartment had a 70s style wallpaper and an old lamp, a bed, and probably the first digital clock ever created. That night I went to sleep, only to wake up and realize that it was 3 a.m. on the dot. The bed I was laying in was perfectly made, almost like it was ironed on with no creases or anything in the blanket. I didn't think anything of it at the time, just that it sucked to kind of wake up in the middle of the night. And 
Then I realized it was cold as hell, like Antarctica cold, like below 50 degrees cold. I'd been in blizzards before, and this was the coldest I'd ever been. My teeth were chattering violently, and I was breathing out huge clouds of air inside my bedroom in the summer. I've heard friends say that it was just air conditioning, but the house for sure doesn't have any AC. Also, I know it's Alaska, but the summer's pretty normal as far as temperature goes, 80s or 90s. After that, things got quiet, like pin drop quiet, and it felt as though the darkness in the corner of the room was closing in. I snatched up all the blankets and pillows in one swoop and bolted out the door. As soon as I was out the door, the temperature went back to normal. I ran for my life, falling multiple times, and slipped and busted my hip twice. Once I got to the stairs, I literally tried to jump up ten steps and broke two of my toes. Almost lost fingernails as well, trying to claw my way up the stairs. And once I got upstairs, I went to sleep on the couch in the living room. My grandma woke me up laughing like, Oh, you didn't like it down there. I replied like, I did, I just like it better up here. I started experiencing unexplained phenomena again and it was during my college years when I was living in an old dormitory on the campus. It was a classic brick building with a long history and plenty of rumors about ghosts and hauntings. I didn't believe in those kinds of stories at first, but that all changed when strange things started happening to me. It started with small things like objects moving on their own and doors opening and closing and strange noises. At first I thought it was just my imagination, but then I started to notice patterns. The occurrences just happened at the time when I was alone in my room, and they became more frequent as time went on. One night I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and as I walked out of my room I saw a figure standing at the end of the hallway. It was a dark figure with no distinct features, but I knew it wasn't a person. I froze and the figure started moving toward me slowly. I tried to scream but no sound came out of my mouth. I closed my eyes and when I opened them again the figure was gone. After that experience, I started doing some research on the history of the building, and I discovered that there had been a fire in the building in the 1940s, and several students had died. Rumor had it that their spirits still haunted the halls, and some people claimed to have seen apparitions. As the semester went on, the occurrences became more frequent and more intense. I would hear voices whispering in my ear, and I would feel a presence in my room even when there was none there. The worst experience was when I woke up to find that I couldn't move. It was like I was paralyzed and I felt a weight on my chest like something sitting on me. I tried to scream, but again no sound came out. I felt like I was being suffocated. It was the scariest experience of my life. And after that night, I knew I couldn't continue living in that dormitory. I moved out as soon as I could and I never looked back. However, the experience stayed with me and made me more aware of the paranormal world. I started researching more and reading books about ghosts and hauntings, trying to understand what happened to me. It's been years since then, but I still feel uneasy whenever I enter a building or a place with a dark history. I know that the paranormal world is real, and I hope that others can learn from my experience and be prepared if they ever encounter it. Me and my employee saw a kid running in our store during Earth Hour. As a manager of a small retail chain store, I've had my fair share of weird experiences. However, this particular one happened just recently and it left us all stunned. It was a normal day. My employee and I were moving about 13 cartons of beer to the store. And suddenly I heard fast footsteps and saw a figure of a child running from the corner of my eye. My employee was freaking out because he saw it run past his eyesight, but when he took a closer look, it turned out to be a trolley. I shrugged it off and went to my cashier to ask if there was a kid running around. He said that there was only grown men who entered to buy beer. I went back to my employee and told him to just do our job and discuss it later. However, after our shift ended, we talked about seeing a kid running. My cashier insisted that no kid had entered the store during Earth Hour, which was the time when we had seen the figure. Then, I decided to ask my store staff to describe the color of the kid's shirt. I counted to three and we both said white. I asked if the boy, if it was a boy or a girl rather, 
We both said girl with long hair. Now I know there's a skeptic in here, but from what I've experienced in the store, I truly believe that something in here is messing with us. We've had strange occurrences before, like products falling off shelves and rolling cages and things moving suddenly, but this was the first time I saw an apparition, albeit from the corner of my eye. If I was the only one who saw it, I would have shrugged it off. But my store staff was genuinely freaked out when he saw it too. Anyway, I just wanted to share this real life story with you guys. And no, we don't have any CCTV access. Only our area manager has that. And besides, the path where we saw it isn't a blind spot of any surveillance. You talk about coincidence, huh? Shadow Man and his buddies. When I was 16 years old, I experienced something that still haunts me to this day. It was a stormy night, and my little brother and I were alone at home. The thunderstorm was insane, and the sky had turned an eerie green color, which I assumed was natural for such storms. However, it had a weird sense of horror or dread that wouldn't go away with it. That's when I felt compelled to look out of one of our living room windows which revealed three cloaked shadow figures floating down my sidewalk and eventually up my driveway. They were all wearing trench coats and fedora hats, and the one in the back was shorter than the other two. I couldn't see their feet, but the sight of them filled me with panic and I immediately locked myself in my bathroom. That night I developed sleep paralysis, which continued for years. Every time I had an episode, I would see the man in the fedora hat with the red eyes staring at me from the foot of my bed. He never spoke, but his presence was enough to scare me. It wasn't until last summer, when I was 29 years old, that I talked to my mom and brother about the incident. That's when my brother brought up the same night, saying that he remembered the sky turning green and the storm stopping abruptly, making everything still and weird. It was a relief to know that I wasn't the only one who experienced it. I've always wondered if anyone else had dealt with something similar. Was it just my imagination, or was it something real? It's strange to think that all these years, I was going insane. But now I have someone who remembers the same incident. Something that's left me with more questions than answers. My friend and I heard something last night, and I can't stop thinking about it. Last month, me and a couple of my friends went to explore these old army forts. I've been to this place a lot of times before, but this time was different. We were the only ones there, and as we were exploring one of the bunkers, suddenly we heard a metallic scraping sound coming from one of the openings. We got freaked out and ran out of there as fast as we could. We were relieved that we got away with no incident, but we were unable to explain what we had heard. Yesterday, my friend and I decided to go back to the forts once again, and it was dark and nobody else was there. We went there to smoke, and as we were talking, we started to hear a cowbell ringing frantically. I froze and my friend looked off into the distance. Suddenly jumped back into the car, I started freaking out and we drove away as soon as possible. After we had calmed down, we decided to pull over and discuss what had happened. My friend said that when he initially heard the noise thought it was nothing, but he looked into the darkness and he saw something shaking really fast, but he couldn't make it out, maybe just a silhouette. He decided to drive back and investigate, and we ended up hearing a noise four more times in different spots, it was like the sound was moving around. I don't know if what we experienced was paranormal or not, but it definitely creeped us out. We couldn't explain the metallic scraping sound from the last time, and now this cowbell ringing out of nowhere. It's just too weird. Maybe it's just our imagination, but we couldn't shake off the feeling that we were being watched. All I know is that I'm not going back there anytime soon. Woman with Goat Legs I always loved listening to stories, especially the ones that gave me the chills. One such story I heard was when I was a kid, and it stayed with me till today. 
So the other day, I was talking to my grandma about it, and she shared some more detail that I wasn't aware of before. The story was about of our neighborhood, and someone who used to work as a baker when he was younger, and as a baker, he had to wake up very early in the morning around 4 a.m. to prepare fresh bread and pastries for the day. And one morning, he was on his usual path, passing a wooden bridge, when he suddenly heard some steps behind him. The steps sounded like hooves. And as he turned around, he saw a tall and very beautiful woman standing behind him. But as he looked down, he saw the woman had goat legs. He had startled and frightened her, and ran away as fast as he could. I was always fascinated by this story, and so I decided to research it a bit further. I found some old forms where people from the Balkans were sharing similar stories about the same entity. They all described the same creature, tall and incredibly beautiful, with goat legs but I was surprised to learn that it was an old Slavic pagan mythology to it, too. There were elves that were described exactly like the one our neighborhood had been seeing. As I delved deeper into the mythology, I learned that these creatures were known as Villa, or Samovilla, and they were considered to be a forest spirit that could also shapeshift. They would also be depicted as beautiful women with goat legs, and they had the power to control nature. In some legends, they were also known to help people, but in others... They could be malicious and cause harm. The more I read about these creatures, the more intrigued I became. I was fascinated to learn about the different mythologies and beliefs that existed in our culture. I couldn't help but wonder if there were more stories like this that were yet to be discovered. Overall, the story of the baker and the goat-legged woman is just one of my many fascinating tales that exist in our culture. It's incredible how these stories have been passed down from generation to generation and have continued to captivate us with their mysterious and supernatural elements. Was it a ghost? I recently took up a ghost-sitting job at a huge old mansion, and everything seemed fine until last night when something strange happened. Yesterday morning, I woke up at the crack of dawn for a workout class and returned around 6 a.m. to find a light on in the hallway that I had no recollection of leaving on, nor could I figure out how to switch it off. I brushed it off initially and thought maybe I just hit it by mistake. And while we were going upstairs to shower, maybe that was it. But later on in the night, around 11 p.m., as I was getting ready to sleep, things started to get really weird. I'm afraid of spiders and I'm claustrophobic, so I'd been sleeping on the couch instead of the basement like the homeowners requested. I had the bathroom light on, and I couldn't turn off the mysterious light from earlier, so I went to bed with both lights on. However, I woke up in a state of panic around 1.30am with my heart racing and feeling like someone was watching me. I looked up to see nothing out of the ordinary, so I began to calm down, but then I noticed that all the lights I'd left on We're all off. This realization hit me hard and I leapt up to the couch in a frenzy and turned all the lights back on. After sitting with the lights on for a few minutes, I heard creaking noises coming from upstairs, like someone was walking stealthily to avoid making a noise. And that was it for me. I was out of there in a flash and I ended up going back to my own house to sleep. Honestly, I don't know what happened with the lights or what those creaking sounds were upstairs. The whole thing was terrifying, and I have no explanation for what happened. Weird creaky sound in the midnight, coming from the top of the roof in the sky. Three years ago, I was in the middle of preparing for my class, and it was the final exam for class 10. It was around 1 p.m., and I was fully engrossed in my studies. But before I go on to describe what happened, let me set the scene for you. I live in an apartment on the top floor, which means that the floor above me is just an open terrace. There's only one other house on this floor, which is where I live, and the other half is open to the sky. People usually come up to the terrace to get some fresh air or to dry their clothes. However, at this time of the incident... There was no one outside as it was midnight. The house I live in has two doors, a wooden one and a steel bar gate. 
In between these two gates, there's a small room where I keep my shoes and other stuff. If I step up out of my door and take three steps forward, I can look through the gate and see out of my door. So that night, as I was studying, I heard a sound coming from outside. It was like someone was pulling a creaky trolley or a vehicle, which was making a slow, constant noise. At first I thought someone was outside, but after a minute or so, I wondered why the sound was still going on. It seemed strange to me that someone would just keep pulling a trolley for such a long time. Well, curiosity got the better of me and I decided to investigate. I opened the door and went near the gate to see what was going on. To my surprise, there was no one out there. The sound was coming from above, about eight or nine feet above the ground. I wasn't able to see what was making the noise because I was at an angle above my vision. Around 80 degrees above my head. However, I could sense that it was coming from the top of my head, particularly, and it felt like something creaky was flying above me. I was too afraid to go out and see what it was. It was already around 1 a.m. and the sound was not stopping. I just stayed inside my house and listened to it, and eventually the sound faded away like a moving object going away from me. I couldn't figure out what it was, and my parents didn't believe me either. They said that it couldn't have been rats pulling or something like that. But when I went out, there was nothing there. Even if it was rats, I shouldn't have been able to hear the sound coming from the bottom. But the sound was coming from the top of the roof. And it went on for like four or five minutes before fading away. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was something else entirely. The first thing that came to mind was a UFO, but I couldn't be sure. It was a strange experience that left me feeling uneasy for a long time. Saw a face in the closet. This is a story that I will never forget because it happened to me. It was in 2015, shortly after my baby cousin was born. My aunt and her boyfriend had just moved into a one-story house, and they asked me to stay with them for a few days to help with the baby. I had never been to this house before, so I was excited to see it. The house was pretty old, but it seemed like a pretty nice place to stay. There were six of us in the house, including the baby, and two pets, a cat, and a small Pomeranian dog. Everything was going well until one night, something came. I was trying to sleep, but I kept hearing strange noises. It sounded like someone was banging on the walls, scratching at the doors, and talking in hushed tones. I tried to ignore it and go back to sleep, but it was too hard. The noises kept getting louder, and I started to feel uneasy. Suddenly, I heard a loud bang on the door in front of me. I looked up and saw a child-sized handprint on the door. It hadn't been there before, and it was just weird because there were no kids in the house except for the two-year-old baby. I took a picture of it with my phone and decided to show it to my friend later as proof that I wasn't making this shit up. But then things got even more creepy. As I took the photo, I saw a face smiling creepily at me through the glass in the closet behind the front door. It was so scary that I couldn't even scream, I just froze. The next morning I woke up and looked at the photo and I was terrified to see that the handprint wasn't the only thing in the picture. I could see the creepy face and it looked like it was trying to say something to me. I felt like something was watching me and I knew that I had to leave that house as soon as possible. When I showed that picture to my family, they didn't believe me. They told me that it was just a reflection of the Pomeranian dog in the glass. But I knew what I saw, and it was not a dog. I still have the picture to this day, and it still creeps me out every time I look at it. Later on, my aunt told me that an older man had died in that house a few years ago. I wish she had told me before I stayed there, because I would have never came. I'm just glad to be moving on from that house, and I hope that no one else experiences what I did. Ghost Kitty Living in my over 100 year old house, I can't help but notice the presence of a ghost kitty. I've named her She because I think I know who she is. I often feel her rubbing against my ankles and I see her out of the corner of my eye, but my living cats are nowhere near me. 
She has even come in to sleep on my bed, and I can feel a small weight on my bed and little feet padding coming across the comforter to cuddle next to me. But when I try to pet her, there's no one there. I became curious about who this ghost kitty was and who it could be, and I decided to ask my elderly neighbor, who was one of the few remaining people who knew of the previous owners and the house and all that stuff. He told me that the woman who originally lived there was a cat lover and had a gray and white tuxedo kitty named Sheba. Sheba was very old when her owner passed away, and my neighbor took care of her while things were being sorted out. Unfortunately, Sheba passed away within a week of her owner passing. It seems that Sheena had never left this house, and I believe that she had become a ghost kitty that roams around the house. Interestingly, I also feel the presence of the original owner in the kitchen, specifically. However, Sheba is the only one that roams around the house like a typical feline. Although I've gotten used to her presence, it can still be startling when I hear her around me, and I do find it comforting that Sheba and her owner are still around for some way, keeping an eye on the house that they love so much. Maybe the 20th time I've seen a girl shadow at night. As a child, I had a few experiences with ghosts, particularly with this little girl, and since then I've become a light sleeper. Last night around 3 a.m., I was sound asleep when I heard some movement. I woke up and to my surprise, I saw a little girl crouching and staring at a controller on the floor. I tilted my head to get a better look, but as soon as she saw me, she dashed into the hallway without making any noise. I was left perplexed and scared. I stayed up until 5 a.m. afraid that the little girl might come back. This isn't the first time something like this has happened to me while staying at my mother's house. I'm currently here because of a divorce. The first incident happened back in November when I was talking with my sister. I was standing in the hallway, and she was in the doorway, and suddenly the little girl with curly blonde hair ran from right to left behind my sister. I only saw her head and her hair and part of her shoulder as I was looking at my sister. We both froze and I asked my sister if she saw it and she said no, but she felt footsteps behind her as if someone was passing by. These experiences left me feeling uneasy and scared and I don't know who this little girl is or why she keeps appearing to me. I'm not sure if I want to know. All that I know is that I'm having trouble sleeping and that I feel like someone's watching me. I hope that these incidents stop soon and that I can get some peace of mind. Did not realize my neighbor's mother passed away the day before I saw her in their window. Three years ago, I moved into a house right in front of my neighbor who's in her mid-40s and lives with her mother who's in her 70s. They're fun people, and they invite me and my kids to get all together and have occasions together. I met her mother multiple times, and she was always a vibrant woman with a smile on her face. Last Friday, I returned home from a business trip, and I saw my neighbor's mother sitting in her usual niche by the dining room window. It was dark outside, and I could see her backlit shadow, so I waved, and she quickly waved back. I thought nothing of it and proceeded to go inside my house. I didn't see my neighbor's car in the driveway, which I found strange because she never left her mom alone due to the risk of falling. Her mother had already fallen a few times and even broke her hip once. Well, the next morning I saw my neighbor and casually asked her how her mom was doing. Then she informed me that her mother had passed away on Thursday morning and that she hadn't seen since. And I was out of town when they were telling the news to people. I was frozen with shock. I didn't tell her that I had just seen her mother sitting in her usual spot the evening before. But I still get goosebumps thinking about it and wonder if it was really her mother's spirit watching over her house. It's a haunted thought. But it could be comforting to think that her mother is still keeping eyes on things from the other side. Ghosts in the Workplace This story is something that I personally experienced with my mom and her friend at a pub, where my mom works as a manager. 
it all took place on a Friday night, which meant that it had been quite busy due to the karaoke event that was going on. The DJ had packed up and left his equipment there to collect the next day, but he had left everything unplugged. Once the pub had shut, I came down from the upstairs flat to help my mom clean up. She was telling me how busy she was when all of a sudden her friend let out a blood-curdling scream. Naturally, we both turned around to see what was happening and we saw my mom's friend standing still, looking very shaken up. She then told us that she felt her apron rise up and someone whispered into her ear. Initially, we brushed it off as just her imagination or a prank. However, things started to get weirder as my mom was cashing up until then. She suddenly heard someone whisper her name into her ear, which really spooked her out. At this point, she accused one of us of playing a prank on her, but we just ignored it and continued with her work. Then out of nowhere, the DJ equipment started buffering, and it began playing quiet music. I turned it off, but I didn't realize it was meant to be unplugged until two hours later when we were on our way home. The pub where my mom works has many other strange things happening there as well. For example, glasses have been known to fly off their shelves, and on the CCTV cameras, clear orbs can be seen flying across the screen. And on several occasions, these orbs have brushed past bar staff and my mom and even customers, causing them to react as though they're being touched. All these experiences left me feeling quite unnerved about the pub. I don't like staying there at late night at anymore. I guess some places are just haunted. And there's not much you can do about it. Precognitive Dreams I had a series of very strange dreams that I just can't explain. It all started in December 2020, about a week before New Year's Eve. I had a dream that I was in a hotel that I'd only visited once during my lifetime. And strangely, I didn't see any people in my dreams, but I felt the presence of my late grandmother, who passed away in 2018, and my girlfriend at the time. It was as if they were there, but couldn't see them. Suddenly the scenery changed, but I found myself walking in town. My phone rang, and it was my girlfriend. And she started the conversation with the word, Sweetie, we have a plan for New Year's. And it was a bit odd, and then I woke up. After a few days, my girlfriend called and said that she had arranged to celebrate New Year's Eve at her friend's house, and she started the conversation the same way that it was in my dream. I told her about the dream, and she said that, I had a very strong intuition. I didn't know what to think about it, but it was weird. Another strange thing happened a week or two later in January. In my dream, I was sitting in the living room. My father asked me if I would bought bread from the bread shop where I buy bread every day. I said that I would overslept, but it was already closed when I got there. Then when I woke up, I went and checked my phone, saw a couple of messages and calls from my father. My sister and I were the only ones home at that time, and my phone was on silent, and I called my father back, and he asked me if I had bought bread. I said that I didn't, and that I just woke up. After that, I checked the clock, and it showed 12.50, and the bread shop closes at 13. It was an unusual occurrence because I never sleep later than 9 a.m. I got ready and went to the bread shop to find it closed. The last strange thing happened last week. One of my colleagues at work had a husband who had bypass surgery, and he was in the hospital. That night I had a dream of my heart stopping out of nowhere, and I had to drink coffee to keep it working. It was like fighting for my own life. My heart would stop, and it would. I'd try to get it back. The next morning, the woman wasn't at work, and everyone was talking about her husband, who had died during the night after many unsuccessful attempts of defrib. It was a bit spooky and I couldn't help but wonder if there was some connection between my dream and the woman's loss. All in all, these dreams were quite strange and unexplainable. I can't help but wonder if there's something more to them, something beyond my understanding. I think I saw the actual Men in Black. I don't know how to feel. The story sends chills down my spine whenever I think about it. It happened a few years ago when I was 17 years old. 
It was summer and my family and I were on our way to visit my uncle who had a small beach house. To get to his house, we had to pass through a large stretch of forest that seemed to go on for about an hour or so. And the sun had risen and was casting a beautiful light in everything. And that's when things started to get strange. My dad turned off his music to check the GPS, and I looked out at the forest, and I noticed that we were the only car on the road, not a single car in front of us or behind us. For a moment, I thought it was strange because it was a very populated area in Oregon, and in the middle of the summer, yet we were the only car on the road for an hour and a half. As I kept staring out at the forest, something caught my eye. A clearing opened up, and I saw two men dressed in black suits, black sunglasses, black gloves, and black shoes. They were tying a big, hairy creature to a tree. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and they were looking at me. Not the car, me. It was like they knew I had seen them. I was terrified and asked my dad if he had seen them, but he seemed confused and he didn't see a thing. He was too focused on driving and checking the GPS. I've never believed in strange things like this, but I still can't explain what I saw. The creature wasn't lashing around or freaking out, and to make it worse, as soon as I, we left the forest and joined the other cars, everything seemed normal again. It was like I just stumbled into a crime scene, and it still haunts me. I've often wondered if anyone else has had a particular experience that was similar to this, or if I can just chalk it up to an hyperactive imagination. Regardless, it was a terrifying experience that I will never forget. I saw a demon dragging a big cage. Let me tell you about a terrifying experience that happened to me two years ago when I was still living with my parents. I woke up in the middle of the night not knowing what time it was and as soon as I opened my eyes I saw a tall figure standing beside my bed. It was so close to me that I could feel its breath on my face. I could see that its body and head were extremely black making it impossible for me to see its face. However, I could tell that it was wearing a long black coat. What made this experience even more chilling was that the figure was dragging a big cage behind it. The cage was so big that it was touching the ground, and the strangest thing was that it was empty. I was sharing the bedroom with my two siblings, but they were both sound asleep. I couldn't wake them up no matter how hard I tried. The demon simply walked away and disappeared into thin air, and in that moment, I just knew that it was a demon, although I can't explain why I had that intuition. Perhaps it was the aura of darkness and evil that surrounded the figure, but whatever it was, it left me paralyzed with fear, and I couldn't move or speak until it was completely gone. After that night, I couldn't sleep well for a long time. The image of the demon in the empty cage haunted me for days, and I was scared to close my eyes at night. Even though I knew that I'd been through a bad dream, the fear and unease that I felt were very real, and to this day I still can't explain what happened, and I pray that I never experience anything like that ever again. It started with three knocks. Let me tell you about an experience I had a few years ago when I was 17. At that time, I moved in with my boyfriend at his parents' house. He had been suffering from night terrors for many years, and I had known about it for five years. He would wake up in a bad mood, and after a few minutes of heavy breathing during his night terrors, his mood would be withdrawn and irritable, and it would take a while for him to level out and become approachable. He had severe insomnia, and this made him sleep very few hours over the course of the day. We had been living there for a few months, and everything seemed normal. Some days I would wake up and see open cabinets and drawers in the kitchen, but I thought it was just someone forgetting to close them after a midnight snack. Until one morning, I joked with his mom about the open cabinets, and she nonchalantly replied, Yeah, that's just the shadow people. They do that all the time. Followed by telling me about how her and her husband had seen them in different areas of the house on multiple occasions. But since, I hadn't experienced anything there myself, just laughed it off. Our bed was against the inside wall of the house, beside the door from the hallway. One day I decided to do some spring cleaning and rearrange the bedroom furniture. 
I pushed the bed against the outside wall next to the window and pulled the TV stand next to the foot of the bed. When my ex came home, we ate and took turns having showers. When I went to open the door to the bedroom, the handle didn't turn. I thought he was playing a joke on me, so I tried twisting the handle back and forth multiple times, but it stayed stationary. When the latch finally released, I pushed the door open with such force that I stumbled into the room, only to see my ex playing Xbox with his headset on, sitting 15 feet away from the door and wondering why it looked like I had just fell in. That was the first time I felt like something could be in the house. The knock started at the fall. We were having some strong winds accompanied by cold rain. There was only one other one in the house that shared the dead end road at the top of the hill where we lived. It was late in the evening and the rain knocked the satellite out. So we got out some DVDs and put on a movie. We both heard scratches on the walls from the shrubs and trees and the leaves hitting the sides of the windows. Then, three faint knocks came from the wall to the right of the bed. This was an exterior wall at the front of the house, so we decided that it was the wind, probably. Some minutes passed and we heard three more knocks come from the wall next to the closet, an interior wall with a large shared dresser along it. We decided to recreate the sound by knocking on the wall behind us just to confirm that the noise that we heard was coming from there. And less than a minute later, Three clear knocks came from the wall directly behind us. We knocked three times back, then the knocks started coming from what seemed like all the walls at once. They were much faster and louder this time and seemed to have no pattern at all, as they were coming from everywhere, but it was not natural. Just as fast as they came, it all stopped. We told his parents who came into the room and knocked three times on the wall. We got the echo back. Back to the night terrors. Since I'd figured out when he was having an episode, I began waking up to heavy breathing and slight twitching, so I'd calmly try to soothe him with a quiet voice and tell him it's okay. And that's where I was. He told me that it helped, so I decided to pray a little bit. I asked him what he liked, and he only told me about the things he used to see. They were always different when he was younger, but more recently, it was a recurring regularly. He wouldn't describe what it looked like, but just that it got closer to him every night, and he was afraid of what might happen if it got close enough to touch him. He woke up once and told me that it would lay down next to him, and he was completely distraught because it was the closest that it had ever been to him. But he said it couldn't touch him when I'm around because it's afraid of you. I didn't know what he meant by that, but I told him that it should be. That's when I began to notice movements. It started with dresser drawers being open in the mornings and after we left the room. I thought maybe the drawer slides were just wearing out from use and were popping back open. But it was always in a different room in a different drawer. If I noticed three drawers open in the morning, I'd close them and go about my day, yet different ones than before would open when I came back. Sometimes they were slightly cracked and others would be pulled all the way to the end. A few times, we caught them opening after we closed them. And we tried every way we could think of for the possibility that it wasn't us and that they weren't being closed correctly in the first place, causing them to roll back. Then one time when my ex was napping, the drawers started to open. I noticed his heavy breathing and panicked REM state, so I tried soothing him with my voice which seemed to calm him down, but then I noticed an empty pop and a can from the TV stand started to rock side to side. It was slow at first and then began to move so fast it seemed like it was vibrating. As it was getting worse, so was his breathing, so I looked at it and shouted in my mind for it to stop, and as soon as I thought it, the can stopped, and he was back to peaceful sleep. I used to be a regular lucid dreamer, I've never had sleep paralysis or any sort of experience like this. The same night as the wobbly can, I was sleeping curled up on my bed and facing in a downward spiral toward the door. When I saw an entity, it stood in the doorway, taller than the frame with the shadow or misty looking body and a face whiter than anything I'd seen before. No discernible facial features, just as if the whiteness was light being pulled into it or through it, almost like a tunnel. It seemed like I could feel it better than I could see it. It felt like rage. It felt like anger and sadness, stronger than I've ever felt in my life. 
Before I could make sense of what was happening, I felt myself stand directly up out of my body and point at the creature and yell at the top of my lungs. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to leave this house. I looked down and saw my ex sleeping beside me, and as quickly as I had stood up, I fell straight back into my body and into my most peaceful sleep. When I woke up, my ex was sitting and watching TV. I looked at him and asked him what the thing looked like from his sleep paralysis, and he told me he didn't want to talk about it. But it would be easier to draw it. He got a notebook and drew exactly what I had seen at that point, and I immediately got the chills and started crying when he showed it to me. He asked me if I'd seen it, and I told him what had happened, and neither of us had seen it since, until he came home from the military. It had been a few years since I had last been seeing my ex-boyfriend, the one who had the night terrors and lived in the haunted house. We had gone our separate ways after our time together in that house, but he recently reached out to me, wanted to reconnect and catch up on old times. I was hesitant at first, but eventually agreed to meet up. We sat down at a local cafe and started chatting about our lives since we last spoke, and he had joined the military and had been stationed overseas for a while. I told him about my job and my recent move to the new city, and it was all very normal and mundane until he brought up the house. He told me that after he came back from military deployment, he decided to visit his parents and stay at the house for a few days. He said that everything seemed normal at first, but then he started experiencing some strange things. He would hear footsteps in the hallway at night, but when he went to investigate, there was no one there. He would feel a cold breeze brush past him, even though all the windows were closed. And then one night, he saw it again, the entity. He described it exactly as I had seen it all those years ago. The misty body, the white face, the overwhelming feeling of rage and sadness. He said that it stood in the doorway of his old bedroom and just stared at him. He couldn't move. He couldn't speak. He couldn't do anything but stare back at it. It was like time had stopped. Eventually, the entity disappeared. My ex-boyfriend was left alone in the room shaking and sweating. He didn't know what to do, so we just lay there in bed, waiting for the morning to come. When he finally got up and went downstairs, he saw that the kitchen cabinets were all open, just like they used to be when we lived there. He knew then that the entity was still in the house, still haunting it. He hasn't been back since. He said that he couldn't handle it anymore, that the memories and the fear were just too much, and I don't blame him. I knew firsthand how terrifying that particular house could be. As we finished our coffee and said our goodbyes, I couldn't help but wonder if the entity was still there, if it was still haunting that old house, and if it was, I hoped that it wouldn't harm anyone else who happened to cross its path. What did Ivan encounter with? It was a typical day and I decided to take a nap in the afternoon. I lay down on my bed and my loyal companion Tara lay on the floor next to me. Suddenly I noticed a strange phenomenon. There was a sphere-shaped flying cloud with a diameter of around 30 centimeters floating through the air. It came in through the door and disappeared into the wall. The cloud was moving at a slow but precise speed and I couldn't help but watch it in awe. Initially, I thought I might just be hallucinating, because it seemed like such a surreal experience. However, Tara also noticed the strange object, and got up to stare at it with me, indicating that it was real. I didn't feel scared or anything negative. I was just curious and intrigued by what was happening. As I lay down to take my nap, I kept an eye out for the mysterious sphere for it to reappear. However, after a few minutes, I didn't see it again. I eventually fell asleep, pondering the strange event that had just occurred. What was that whistle? When I was just a young lad of around nine years old, I started experiencing incredibly strange and disturbing phenomenon that would occur during the night. Every single night, I would hear this ear-piercing whistle that would start off faint and distant, but then gradually get closer and closer until it was right next to my ear. 
The sound was so annoying and unbearable that I couldn't help but cover my ears with my blankets, hoping that it would somehow muffle the sound. Despite my desperate attempts to block out the sound, I still couldn't shake the nagging feeling that something was off. One morning after another sleepless night of dealing with the incessant whistle, I decided to ask my family if they had been hearing it too, and to my surprise, everyone denied hearing anything out of the ordinary. I was baffled and confused. Was I the only one who could hear it? This strange occurrence continued to happen for two weeks straight. Each night I'd be jolted awake by the obnoxious sound, and each morning my family would act like nothing was out of the ordinary. It was like I was living in a different reality altogether. One fateful night, however, I finally reached my breaking point. The whistle was louder and grating more than ever before, and I simply couldn't take it anymore, so I summoned up all the courage I had and got out of bed. I walked over to my bedroom window and slowly opened it, all the while bracing myself for what I might find. But to my surprise, there was nothing there. No source of the whistle, no shadowy figure lurking in the darkness. It was just me, my window, and the stillness of the night. As I stood there, taking it all in, the whistle slowly faded away until it was no more. From that night on, I never heard that sound again. I still don't have any answers for what it could have been or where it came from. But I do know one thing for certain. That experience will always stay with me, haunting me with its eerie mystery. Unexplained Light Flash A few years ago, I had a strange experience with my sister that I'll never forget. We were both lying in bed, scrolling through our phones, when we saw something that we couldn't explain. It was a flash of light, almost like a camera flash, that came from one side of the room. At first, we both ignored it, hoping that it was just one of us accidentally taking a Snapchat selfie with the wrong camera. But as the seconds ticked by, we couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. The next day, we talked about what had happened. The flash had come from where the bedroom door was, but the door was shut. It was close to the ceiling, and there were no outlets or windows in that area. The blinds were shut on the opposite side of the room, so there was no chance that it was headlights of a passing car. I had seen car headlights in that room before, but this was very different. It was just like a camera flash, and it lit up the room for a split second. It was unexplainable. A few nights later, my sister and I were discussing the flash again before we went to bed. As we were laying there, both wide awake on our phones, we saw it again. And this time, we didn't say anything. We just grabbed each other, pulled the blankets over our heads, and called our dad to come check it out. When he arrived, we explained what had just been happening. and We were both scared and didn't know what to do. My dad went over to the area where the flash had come from and looked around. But there was no explanation, nothing that could have caused the flash. It was as if it had come from nowhere. After that night, my sister and I were too scared to sleep in that room again. We started sleeping in the guest room down the hall, where we felt safer. But even now, years later, we still talk about the strange experience. We still can't explain what happened. We probably never will. It's a mystery that will always remain unsolved. Mimics can fuck right off. On summer, my dad had taken me on a trip to repair the roof on one of the buildings on our property. Unfortunately, I was going through a rough patch with my health and was mostly confined to the house, crocheting and watching horror movies to pass the time. On a particularly windy day, the gusts were so strong that they rattled the windows and created an uproar of noise. It was undoubtedly not the best time to be up on the roof. So, my dad had promised to take a break from roofing and do some yard work instead. Bored with my crocheting and tired of watching scary movies, I turned off the television and focused on my crochet work. It wasn't until after lunchtime that my dad had returned to the house, mentioning that he's going to go relax in the hammock and read for a bit. Suddenly, I heard my dad scream my name in a terrified tone with his unique accent adding to the fright. 
As my name is Vanessa, it was evident that he had called out my name, and I immediately worried that he had fallen off the roof, or worse, somehow he was in danger. So I ran as fast as I could toward the back of the house where I had collided with him. He was out of breath and I had a terrified look. So did he. I was worried sick and asked him what was wrong. He told me that he had heard me screaming in fear, as if I was in danger or heard. It was perplexing because at the same moment we both heard each other's voices scream our names. Now this may seem odd, but I call my dad Daddy, which doesn't sound anything like Vanessa. We were both equally terrified and we couldn't understand how this could happen. For weeks we tried to explain the occurrence, the rattling noises and the creaking doors and listening to the tree branches when it's windy, but nothing came close. Although we had experienced spooky happenings on our property before, this was different because of the mimicry of our voices. We couldn't explain what had just happened, whether it was a ghost, a demon, or just a prankster. What was its purpose? And what was it trying to achieve? Nevertheless, we always check out any weird stuff on our property and never let this instance of mimicry lead us to believe that it's a trick instead of an actual emergency. One STG thing is following me. As a 19-year-old female living in an older Texas town, I've had my fair share of strange experiences. Most of them began when I was five years old, so about 15 years ago, but things got worse when I got a little bit older. My family first moved to Texas for my dad, and he was doing work way back in the mid-2000s, and I didn't feel like I was being watched until we moved into a large house in a pretty damn good neighborhood. The house was gorgeous, with two stories, a pool, and a large backyard. My room was on the same side of the house as the rest of my family's. However, after my parents' divorce, I had to move rooms to make room for the younger kids. The room I was now in was the only bedroom on the opposite side of the house, with a media room on the same side. But I always hated going into that room. When I first walked in, I was immediately met with an overwhelming anxiety. I didn't understand why, but it felt like a hundred pairs of eyes were all staring at me. I told my parents about it, but they thought it was just because the room was always dark. However, I was never afraid of the dark until I lived in that house. I avoided going into the room whenever I could, and I would always close all the doors when there were no people inside. I would especially make sure the doors were closed before I went to bed because I got a perfect view of the entrance to the media room from my room. Every time after I closed doors, I felt like I was running up the stairs super fast after turning the lights off, but way worse. I would occasionally feel the same sense of overwhelming anxiety when I was just near the room or lying in my room. There were two incidents that I vividly remember happening in that house that really made me realize that my family weren't the only ones there. The first major incident happened when I was about nine. My family was going to go on a movie marathon in the media room for that night, and I was excited because I didn't mind being in there if I wasn't alone. We had eaten a fun dinner, and since I was a good kid, I, I was basically offering to do the dishes while my family set up upstairs. I was, well, I was getting ready to go upstairs to meet the rest of my family when out of nowhere the feeling came back. I was hit like with a wave, with that familiar overwhelming anxiety. But it was way worse than normal. I started to throw up and I began to have a panic attack. I was crying, throwing up, and felt like I couldn't breathe. I was all alone in our kitchen, hovering over the sink, when I felt a hand on the back of my neck. I whipped around and saw an outline of something, but not a full figure. I violently threw up again, and I heard someone whisper in my ear. I don't actually remember all of what it said, but I do remember it mentioning God. I started to bawl, but I was able to breathe again. We are a religious family, which is why I began to bawl after it whispered. I was still sick, but I didn't feel like I was in danger or anything. My older sister later found me over the sink, after I didn't meet the rest of them upstairs. She told me I had been almost maybe an hour since I had left, and they figured I'd just gotten distracted. 
I didn't tell any of my family about what happened, and they just thought I had a panic attack. The second incident happened around four years later when I was 13. It was really late at night, and I was ironically watching Supernatural. It was a school night, and I remember feeling anxious as I watched the clock. I didn't want to oversleep and be late for school, but I also didn't want to go to bed. You see, I had been experiencing some strange occurrences in my Texas home, and I was always on edge, waiting for the next incident. The incidents had started when I was just five years old, shortly after my family moved to Texas for my father's work. We moved into a beautiful two-story house with a pool in the large backyard. My room was on the same side of the house as the rest of the family's, but that changed after my parents' divorce, and I moved to a different room to make room for my younger siblings. My new room was on the opposite side of the house, and there was a media room on the same side, which I avoided at all costs. The media room made me feel incredibly uneasy but I already told you about all that. <clears throat> We've since moved out of that house, but I still have one unfortunate experience in our current home. We moved into a gated high-income community, and the new house is really nice, but I still feel uneasy, especially when I'm staying in the media room. The last major incident happened about a year ago on Christmas Day. I was visiting my dad, and I didn't have a room of my own, so I was staying in with my younger brother. My older sister and I were sleeping in the game room while visiting. We somehow got on the topic of the old house and I ended up telling her everything that happened to me while we were there. She told me she felt like there was something in the house too, but nothing ever happened to her personally. She was never really there. She lived with her grandparents for school, but when she visited the side of the house that my room was on, it made her uncomfortable at that time. We finished talking and she told me that I may be a clairvoyant but I don't really believe in those kinds of abilities. Something in my house mimicking voices and whistles. As someone who lives in a two-story house with just my feline companion, N, I never expected to encounter anything paranormal. In fact, when I first moved in roughly two months ago, the place seemed devoid of any creepy or haunted vibes, which was a pleasant surprise given my unusual fear of sleeping alone in the house. However, my comfortable and peaceful nights were interrupted roughly three weeks ago when I began hearing my own voice being mimicked back to me from other rooms or even downstairs. At first, I dismissed these instances as just mere figments of my imagination, since they were so quiet but things took a more serious turn when I heard a very clear hey buddy coming from behind a closed door in another room, a room that was completely empty at the time. The same occurrence happened a couple of times in different parts of the house, which left me feeling spooked and uneasy. But things took a more sinister turn when the person taking care of N while I was away this weekend informed me that he heard his own whistle being mimicked back from him from downstairs one morning. He does a very specific whistle to call N, and he was understandably rattled by the experience and fact. He grabbed his keys and left immediately after. As someone who has his fair share of paranormal experiences throughout my life, I never thought I'd have to deal with it alone. Now the prospect of returning home and being alone at night fills me with dread and fear. I'm at a loss on what to do. I'm not sure if anyone's had similar experiences that they can share with me. If anyone has any advice or tips on how to handle these strange happenings, I would be eternally grateful. For now, I just hope whatever's in my house will leave me and my beloved cat alone. Weird figure posing as my sister. Back when I was living in Virginia and was around 9 or 10 years old, I had an experience that still haunts me to this day. It all started when my friend and I went into my sister's room to bother her, a common occurrence for us at the time, but something was off about the whole situation. As we entered the room, I noticed the person on the bed, whom I assumed was my sister, didn't look anything like her. I couldn't see her face and the long black hair was coming from under the covers, almost like a character from The Ring. Despite the strange appearance, I asked if she was sleeping, and the figure shifted into position. I took it as a sign that she wanted to be left alone, 
so my friend and I headed downstairs to grab a snack. But as we walked into the kitchen, we were shocked to see my actual sister standing there. Confused, we asked her if she had just been upstairs, and she said she was just returning from taking her dog for a walk. She had no idea what we were talking about. Feeling unnerved, we rushed back upstairs to investigate, and we found something that chilled us to the bone. Under the covers, we found the head of a Bratz doll. But the doll had brown hair that was way too short to match the long black hair we had seen earlier. Additionally, the figure in the bed was much larger than the doll, so it didn't make any sense. What's even more unsettling is that every time I bring up this incident with my sister, she has no recollection of it at all. It's like it never happened, which only adds to the mystery and fear surrounding the experience. I've been trying to figure out if that was the only time that it happened, and the answer continues to elude me. It's something that I still think about from time to time and sends shivers down my spine. Interacted with deceased family members leading up to my grandmother's passing. Six months ago, I flew up to my grandmother's house across the country. I had moved out two years prior, and her health had been steadily declining since. My grandmother was in her mid-70s at the time and had been placed into a home hospice care. I had purchased tickets to a concert an hour away from her house, figuring that I'd come to visit my child at home, spend a day or two with her, and then help cheer her up and go to my concert and fly home the next day. Upon arriving, I found that the place was a bit of a mess. My cat had been neglected and the caretaker, a family friend of ours, was just kind of bumming around. I was a bit panicked, but it was all right. My grandmother was doing fine giving her medical, you know, giving her medical conditions. Not great, but she had just a good amount of fight in her. At least another three or six months or so, maybe. As the place was a mess, I decided to spend the night at my friend's house. We woke up the next morning and headed over to make my grandmother some lunch and hang out. As we walked in, the house was filled with smoke to the point where I was having trouble breathing and expected everyone inside and my cat and my grandmother and caretaker to be dead. Thank God they weren't. I called the fire department and they vented the smoke out and left. Turned out the caretaker started a pot of pasta the night before, fell asleep, and ignored it until we found it. The hospice nurse came for my grandmother and found out that she was not doing so good. Not surprising, given that she had just been inhaling smoke for the past eight or nine hours. She was a bit sleepy and delirious, and as expected, I guess. The nurse and my, well, the nurse and my friend decided it was the best time for my grandmother to go home or to nursing care, since she couldn't be alone now, obviously. My grandmother was still coherent and agreed reluctantly. The night was the night of my concert, and she insisted that I go to my concert and have fun and not to worry about her. So I went to the concert and spent the night at my friend's place again. We went over again the next morning and found my grandmother knocked out, just sleeping peacefully. It was around 9 a.m., and as the day progressed, I could tell she had taken a turn for the worse, from coherent to sleepy to nonverbal. The nurses came by and gave her morphine every four hours, and it was just terrible. Every time I walk into her room, it got very cold. Just near her doorway, extremely cold. The rest of the house and her room were fine, but the doorway was cold. I thought it was strange, but brushed it off until I felt like I was being watched. I didn't mention this to my friend, who had stayed with me essentially this whole weekend, now considering the situation going on, but he brought up that he felt that way too. That's when I told him I felt it. I awkwardly, sort of jokingly brought up that I'd heard about this phone app called Ghost Tube. Whether it's being legitimately trusted or not, whatever. I said, obviously, I know it sounds stupid, but fuck it, morbid curiosity, you know? So we opened it up, just kind of hanging in my room. When I had a bright LED strip light up on the sound detection mode, and I asked some basic questions again. Not expecting anything like, is anybody here with us? Basic childhood like ghost, you know, hunting stuff. Nothing, no response whatsoever. So I told my friend that I was going to check out my grandmother. And as I headed toward the door, the ghost tube app suddenly picked up a message. Don't go or don't leave. 
My friend and I were both frozen, staring at the phone in disbelief. A few seconds later, the app displayed no and stay here. We looked at each other visibly freaked out. The room felt colder than ever and we both had goosebumps. Carefully responded to the app's messages by asking who are you and is this someone here with us? The response I got back was Sailor, which is my grandmother's last name before she got married. Her deceased mother was also staying in my room for a year or two, so the fact that the app picked up on her maiden name was quite startling. At this point, I was freaking out. He was just kind of frozen. I was teary-eyed and continued asking questions. This went on for another half hour, with the app giving us genuine answers to our questions, albeit some a little bit vague. Never did we receive any simple yes or no answers, though. We also noticed that the LED lights in my room and the sound detection mode were flickering in response to our questions, even when there was no sound. So we repeated some of our questions and added, using the lights twice for yes and once for no. We asked questions like, are you here to help my grandmother reach the other side? And all the answers we received were what you'd expect. This went on for about four or five hours, and I remember feeling a sense of relief and sadness at the same time. At one point, while my friend and I were discussing how insane this was, and we must have just been crazy, my mom suddenly went white. Or sorry, my friend suddenly went white. His eyes widened and he froze. I asked him what was going on, but he was too freaked out to respond immediately. Eventually, he reluctantly said, I just saw a figure pass by the doorway. I was skeptical at first, but then I saw it too. It was tall and dark and seemed to move past the doorway and disappear. We both freaked out and we were about to leave the room when we suddenly heard my grandmother calling out my name. We quickly ran to her side and found her semi-conscious. We tried to calm her down and make her comfortable, but we knew that her time was running out. After a while, the hospice nurse arrived to administer more morphine to my grandmother. My friend and I took this as a sign to leave and let my grandmother rest. And as we walked out of the room, the ghost tube app displayed one final message. I love you. We both froze and looked at each other. It was clear to us that this was not just some random coincidence. We felt that we had truly connected with someone or something beyond the physical realm that day. As we left my grandmother's house that day, I felt a deep sense of loss, but also a newfound appreciation for life and the unknown. I realized that there's so much more to this world than what we can see or touch, and that maybe, just maybe, there's something beyond this life that we're not meant to fully understand. I feel like I'm going crazy and I don't know what to do. Shadow Hat Man. It was a few nights ago when I experienced something that still sends shivers down my spine. I was driving home at around 8.30 p.m. with my furry friend, my dog, on my lap and her head out the car window. I had just turned the corner in the parking lot of my condo heading toward my parking spot when I caught sight of a large shadow from the corner of my eye and my driver's side. My heart skipped a beat and I panicked, thinking I had almost hit someone. I quickly turned to look at the shadow, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. I was only driving about 10 miles an hour since I was in a parking lot. My dog didn't react at all. I was about to shrug it off when my driver's side blind spot sensor went off, indicating that something was there. I looked at my side mirror and saw a tall shadow figure with red glowing eyes running after my car, just like a human. I was horrified and I sped up, but the creature seemed to be keeping pace with me. The side center stayed on the entire time, and I could see the creature until I pulled into my parking spot. I was trembling with fear as I was pretty sure that I was gonna die when I got out, but to my surprise, nothing was there. I walked over to the area where I first saw it, and there was nothing to be found. My dog never reacted, which made me wonder Maybe it was just my imagination. But the sensor was not my imagination, and I saw it out of the corner of my eye before the sensor went off. This wasn't the first encounter with the creature. 
I've had two other experiences that felt like and looked like the same thing, and both were sleep paralysis. I had heard of the hat man or shadow people before my sleep encounters, but found out about them and looking them up and stuff. I attributed my experiences to sleep paralysis, and at that time my now husband and I had just moved into the condo, and both times it happened is when he had left early for work and I was still asleep. In my dream state, I thought some man had broken in and he was going to attack me. And both times, my husband had forgotten to lock the front door. I told him I was feeling paranoid and to please remember to lock the door. And after that, I never really remember it happening again until now, which is about three years later, and I was awake. It feels like whatever it is, it's the same creature. It's hard to describe, but it feels malicious, like it wants to hurt me. It feels like I'm going crazy. I've been having dreams of it chasing me for years, and I somehow know that it's a man chasing me, but I never see him. And in my dreams, I'm always running and hiding for my life. The strange thing is, is that I've been running in this recurring dream for as long as I can remember, and lately I feel like I'm being watched. And when I walk my dog at night, I swear I hear footsteps every time I turn around. Nothing. I'm constantly searching for similar experiences online, but I can't seem to find anything on shadow people chasing others. Do you think I'm just paranoid? Or has anyone else had similar experiences? I feel like I'm just going crazy and I don't know what to do. The shadow man has visited my bed twice that I know of. I've always been hesitant to speak about my two experiences that I've never been able to explain, nor do I really want to understand them. The first experience took place when I was in junior high school. I remember being sick one night and left an orange nightlight on by my bedside table. I fell asleep and started dreaming. In my dream, I found myself lying in bed at the top of a long driveway on a hill. I looked down between my feet, down the driveway to the road, and then into the forest on the other side. As I lay there, I noticed a section of the forest that was darker than the rest of the trees. All of my alarms went off in my head, and I stared at the dark spot, realizing that it was the size of a tall man. I never saw the man move, But in the blink of an eye, I realized that he was no longer. And it was just in the middle of the road. Then another blink, and he was at the start of the driveway with the road behind him. Still, it was all dark. I could only see him because he was darker than the surrounding trees. Every few seconds, he had moved closer, but again, I never saw him move. He just got larger and larger and closer and closer until he's standing at the foot of my bed. In my dream, I was trying to scream, but I couldn't. Then it opened its eyes, and there were orange light reflecting out of his black face. Suddenly, I woke up only to see the shadow at the end of my bed with two orange glowing eyes. I screamed and swung my arms out, knocking the orange nightlight onto the floor and breaking it. The shadow was gone, but I was awakened to a whole night. I never understood what happened. I told myself I hadn't seen him at the end of my bed and that it was just the end of the dream still in my mind when I woke up. Fast forward 15 years later, I had moved into a new house, a 1920s bungalow with a lot of history. It felt like a good space to me, but on my third night or so there, I was sound asleep when in my dreams, I started to feel terrified. I don't even remember what the dream was, but I knew that I was in terrible danger. Suddenly in my dream, my best friend from high school, who had died our senior year, was screaming at me. You have to wake up. You have to wake up. My eyes flew open, and there it was again, the shadow man leaning over my bed. Pitch blackness, except for two dark, oily, wet spots, like obsidian where the eyes should be. I snarled. Get the fuck away from me. And without me seeing it move, it was just a few feet back, then a few feet more then at the end of my bed, at the bedroom wall, and gone. I never saw it move, only 
registered movements like you would under a strobe light. First here, then there, and then there, but no visuals of actual movement. At the wall, it seemed to fold itself and then was gone. That was in 1992, and I've never seen it again. One time a few years ago, my dog woke growling, and I woke to the feeling of maybe it being in the house, but down the hall. I told it to leave, and the feelings disappeared, and I fell right back asleep. I've never sought to find more about what happened. The rational side of me just wanted to pretend it was a dream, but that same rational side of me also was seeing every flag up, and that I was in danger, and that I couldn't just ignore that such a thing was standing over my bed. It was a shadow figure with two dark, oily wet spots where his eyes should be. As it turns out, the house was built in the 1920s and had a long history of mysterious deaths and strange happenings. There had been several reported sightings of ghosts and other supernatural entities throughout the years. Some people even claimed that the house was built on top of an ancient burial ground, which could explain the strange occurrences. I was both fascinated and terrified by what I had discovered, and it seemed like there was some truth to the rumors about the house, and I couldn't shake the feeling that this shadow man was somehow connected to it. I decided to contact a psychic and see if they could shed any light on the situation. The psychic told me that the shadow man was a manifestation of negative energy that had been lingering in the house for many years. She said that the energy had attached itself to me because I was sensitive to paranormal activity. She also confirmed that my friend who had passed away was trying to protect me from the negative energy, which is why he had appeared in my dream. The psychic advised me to cleanse the house of negative energy and to protect myself with positive energy. She gave me several tips on how to do this, including burning sage and keeping positive energy crystals in the house. I followed her advice and performed a cleansing ritual in the house, and since then, I've never experienced anything or any other strange experiences, and I feel much more at peace. Looking back on the experience, I realized that it was a turning point in my life. It opened up my eyes to the existence of the supernatural and made me more aware of the energy that surrounds us. I'll never forget the shadow man and the terror that he brought into my life, but I am grateful for the lessons that I learned from the experience. Rick Akasek, my precognition story and further experiences with him. Hi, I'm Jane, and let me tell you about my strange but incredible experience with the late Rick Alkasek. I've been a lover of music for as long as I can remember, and I've always had a special place in my heart for the classics of the 60s throughout the 80s. I'm only 17, but my love for this music is just as strong as any other fans. It was the night before my 14th birthday when something inexplicable happened. I was getting ready to go to a friend's house for an early celebration, and I wanted to put on some music to lighten the mood. I picked up my car CD, which I had barely listened to before, but I felt the most horrible gut feeling. It was as if something deep inside me was telling me that something was very wrong. I looked back at the CD and saw Rick Okasek's picture. Suddenly I knew with absolute certainty that he was going to die. I tried to shrug it off and not say anything to my mom, but the feeling struck me. And later that night I put on Steve Miller instead to take my mind off of what had just happened. A few hours after, I got into my friend's house and I got the news. Rick Okasek had just died. I couldn't believe it. I barely knew anything about him, yet I was both crushed and shocked that I learned this before the world knew and didn't tell anybody about it. Since that day, Rick has shown up in my dreams from time to time, usually with a bright purple aura around him. It's the color I've come to associate with him and his presence. We don't talk much in these dreams, but we do share time together before I wake up. It's as if he's just there to hang out with me. But Rick doesn't just visit me in my dreams. When I'm awake, he lets me know he's there by knocking over a book of his lyrics and poems that I keep on my desk. It's a little unsettling at first, but I've come to accept it as just his way of saying hello. For the past two years on the anniversary of his death, I started a little ritual. I light a purple candle and talk and spin records with them using an opalite pendulum. 
I set some records on the floor and he chooses what music he wants to hear by swinging the pendulum. It's always an amazing experience and he's quite insistent with his decisions. He makes pretty great musical choices too. Sometimes I think to myself, why would Rick Okasek hang out with a 17 year old from Wisconsin that never even knew him? But I'm glad to have him around. It's like we have some sort of cosmic connection that goes beyond time and space. I still can't explain why I had that gut feeling that fateful night, but I'm grateful for it. It led me to discover Rick Okasek's music and connect with him in ways I never thought possible. I may never fully understand what's going on, but I'm happy to have him as a friend, even if it's just in the spiritual realm. My deceased dog may still be around. It was a few days after my Labrador passed away, and I had just come back home on Tuesday, April 4th. I was sleeping soundly until I was awoken by a distinct sound that seemed like a cry. Initially, I was irritated at being disturbed from my sleep, but my anxiety started to rise as I tried to go back. I couldn't shake off the thought of what could have made such a noise at 3 a.m. Despite my unease, I eventually fell back to sleep. The following day, nothing noteworthy happened, and I went about my day as usual. However, on Thursday, April 7th, something strange occurred. I was in the middle of a conversation with my mom about something unrelated to our dogs. When we suddenly stopped talking, my mom looked frightened, and that's when I realized. I had heard a distinct sound, and I'd heard this before. It was the same cry I heard a few days earlier. I felt myself shaking as I asked my mom if she heard it too. She responded in the affirmative, confirming that we both heard a muffled cry sound. It was around 2 a.m. and we immediately checked on our other family members to see if any of them had made that sound. However, everyone was either asleep or doing nothing out of the ordinary. My oldest sister, who usually laughs a lot, said she hadn't laughed the whole night. We were all puzzled and couldn't figure out what was happening. After this strange occurrence, I went back to bed and didn't experience anything else that night. It's hard to say what was causing these sounds. Maybe it was all in our heads because we were all struggling with our beloved one's dog recently dying. And we wished that maybe we could have done things differently. It's also possible that it was an animal since we lived you know, far from the city. However, the fact that both my mom and I heard the same cry on two separate occasions makes me wonder if it could have been something else entirely. Looking back at it now, it all makes sense. The first cry sound I heard that woke me up was likely from my Labrador who was in the next room when he passed away on March 31st. As for the second cry sound my mom and I heard, I can't be sure, but what I do know is that it was a unique sound and we'd never heard it before. It's comforting to think that it might be one of our dog's way of saying goodbye and it's assuring that he's in peace now. Something was running behind my car. As I drove home last night going around 55 miles an hour, I suddenly noticed something human-shaped running behind my car. There were no other vehicles on the road and it was a rural area. I usually check my rearview mirror this late at night because deer are known to dart out of nowhere. But this time, I was looking at something that was not a deer. It was a strange, unknown entity that was following me for nearly five minutes. I kept glancing back at it, trying to figure out what it was. I couldn't get a clear look at it, but it was definitely humanoid in shape. Living in the Midwestern Great Lake area, I was familiar with stories of creepy urban legends and such, but I'd never experienced anything like this before in my life. I could feel my heart beating faster as I tried to come up with a rational explanation for what I was seeing, but there was none. As I approached a street light, I looked back once more, and to my surprise, The figure vanished into thin air. It was as if it had never been there in the first place. I felt a wave of relief wash over me, but at the same time I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. I couldn't wait to get home and share this bizarre experience with anybody. I immediately called up my best friend and recounted the entire incident in vivid detail. She was equally freaked out, and we spent the next hour scouring the internet for any explanation or similar account. To this day, I have no idea what I saw that night could have been my mind playing tricks on me or something supernatural. 
But one thing's for sure, that experience left a lasting impression on me, and I don't think I'll ever forget it. The Summer Camp Encounter I remember this one summer when I went out on Boy Scamp Campout in North Wisconsin, in this well-known campsite with the smiling tent as a mascot. There were about a dozen of us, along with some scout leaders, all in the clearing where one of the many troops were set up. My best friend from childhood and I shared a tent, and it was maybe the third night when things started to get strange. I fell asleep normally that night, but I woke up to some strange sounds in the middle of the night, maybe around two or three. It was hard breathing or soft grunting, and it was really unnerving. I looked around the tent and saw nothing out of the ordinary. Then I noticed my friend was awake too, and we both froze in fear. I gestured for him to be quiet and listened as something started brushing up against our side of the tent, poking into the fabric like antlers. Suddenly, something sharp and black poked through the tent, and we heard a loud exhale. Whatever it was, it stepped back, and we heard branches crunching and twigs snapping as it faded into the distance. We stayed awake for another hour whispering to each other and trying to rationalize what had just happened. We wondered if we should check outside the tent, but we were too scared. When we woke up in the morning, we found three to four more holes in the tent, similar to the first one. We checked around the tent to see if we can find any evidence of what had happened behind our tent, and we found bare human footprints that circled around the tent several times. They didn't lead to or from the tent, but just made three or four rings that looped around. My friend and I were both really freaked out by the whole experience, and we talked about it a few times on the trip, but we haven't spoken about it since. It's been a few summers now, and the details are starting to get a bit fuzzy, but I'll never forget that strange night in the woods. What just happened? As I lay in bed next to my young son, my mind is wandering aimlessly when I suddenly saw a trip in my vision. It was like someone was unzipping a part of my reality, just to the left of where my eyes were focusing in the room, and to my shock, a young woman had torn through into my reality and was staring at me intently. It was as if she had opened a bag to see what was inside. I could sense that in her reality, she was walking on a busy street in broad daylight, I felt like she was just curious to see into someone else's life, without any malicious intent. She didn't say anything, she just stared at me with an intense gaze. I started to feel uneasy and asked her to go, and to my relief she closed the rip and disappeared. I couldn't help but wonder if this was a common occurrence and whether people often looked into other people's realities. I was left with so many questions and had no explanation for what had just happened. It was such an unusual experience that left me feeling both bewildered and perplexed. I spent hours researching and looking for any similar experiences, but I came up empty-handed. As time went on, I tried to make sense of what I had witnessed, but still I had no explanation. I shared the story with a few close friends, but they couldn't offer any rational explanation either. Some suggestions that could be maybe lucid dreaming, while others believed it could have been a hallucination but neither of these explanations seemed to fit what I'd experienced. And to this day, I still have no explanation for what happened that night. It remains one of the most inexplicable experiences of my life, leaving me to wonder if there are parallel realities that are somehow able to tap into. While it may seem like a far-fetched idea, I can't help but believe that there's something more to this world than what meets the eye. My Paranormal Encounter In 2014, I was living in an area near Gainesville, Florida. One normal evening, my older brother and I were playing Call of Duty Black Ops on my Xbox 360. After we finished, we had to clean up the house and turn off all the lights before we were allowed to go to sleep. While doing the nightly chores, I noticed that the Xbox had been turned on by itself, which was very weird because I clearly remembered turning it off. I wasn't too alarmed, so I simply powered it off again and crawled into the lower bunk of me and my brother's bunk bed. 
As I was laying in the bunk, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched intensely. It was keeping me up, and it only seemed to intensify more as I tried to ignore it. Then it happened. I heard my Xbox 360 power on again, and it instantly threw me off because all of the remote controls were on the TV stand, and the only way it would power on is if the heat signature was right in front of the power button. I was startled by this, so I waited for a while, but I eventually got up and turned it off again, and as I crawled back into my bed and got comfortable again, I was greeted with chills running back up my back as I head back and the Xbox powered back on again. At this point, I was both scared and frustrated. However, this time, before I could even act, I was greeted by a bright flash of light in my face, like someone took a picture of me with the flash on. It was sudden and silent, and it was just like that, a flash. And before I could react, my room was refilled with darkness. The next thing I heard was my older brother asking, Did you see that? I could hear the concern in his voice. As soon as I responded with the concerned yeah, a second flash happened, except this time the origin of the flash seemed higher up, like it was oriented toward my brother's part of the bed, and after this my brother and I went silent and watched in confusion and an ease as the flash reappeared in different parts of the house. Based on how the light would reflect off the walls, he couldn't tell where it was. It was going on in all rooms of our house, flashing multiple times in every room and slowly making its way down the hallway. Eventually, it made its way into our kitchen, and at this point, my brother and I got out of bed and we were watching the flashes happen in the living room. Then we watched as the kitchen lights turned on and off, except this time, rather than a flash, it seemed as if the light switch was being flipped repeatedly. After about three minutes, my brother mustered up the courage, grabbed a pocket knife, and headed out of our room and went into the kitchen to check it out. The light switch stopped flickering, and the incident was over. To this day, this is one of the weirdest incidents that I've ever experienced. I'd like to know if anybody has any opinion, or if anyone has experienced or read about something similar. My dead grandmother comforted me when my appendix ruptured and made me call the EA. Now I'm a seer. As an atheist, I never really believed in the existence of the supernatural or the afterlife in general. However, my experience in October last year made me question everything I'd ever believed in. For two weeks, I had been dealing with intense abdominal pain, which only worsened with each passing day. I went to the emergency room three times, but each time I was sent back with painkillers and told to come back if the information worsened. I couldn't hold food anymore, and I hadn't slept properly for two weeks with the most excruciating pain I'd ever felt. I even had a fever and vomited and I was drinking water and it was almost impossible. And despite all this, I still didn't go back to the hospital because the waiting time was about seven hours and I couldn't afford to waste that much time when I had work to do. At the end of the second week, I woke up in complete shock because my body was twitching and the pain was so severe that I vomited immediately after waking up. That's when I heard a voice and looked at the end of my bed. There I saw my grandmother who was the one who raised me and loved me more than anyone else in my family. I adored that woman so much, but I was in complete shock because I didn't recognize her at first. Her voice was much younger and her face much more youthful, and her hair curly brown instead of that whitened strands that I used to know. I couldn't see what she was wearing because she was almost so white that she appeared like she was on fire or surrounded by light beams. She walked towards me, and the only thing I could say was, I love you, Omi. She didn't reciprocate, but she looked incredibly sad and asked me to call somebody for help. I told her that I did, and they sent me back numerous times. It was to no avail. They wouldn't help me. She interrupted me, saying, You need to go because you're dying, and I don't want to see that. You can't go just yet. Not so young. Call for help. I replied. The pain lessened. I can sleep it away. My voice getting quieter, my body becoming very tired. I was so exhausted like never before and I wanted to sleep, but for the first time I've known her, she got seriously angry. You need to call somebody. Call somebody to help you. Don't go to sleep. Don't sleep now. I love you, but you must go now. Go, hurry. My body jolted up with 
force I'd never felt. I called the emergency services to come and get me. My voice became slurred. And while they weren't really talking to me in the hospital, which was only nine minutes away, I already fainted and was in and out of consciousness. I woke up on the operation table a second before they applied the mask and then faded away. The operation took about six hours to fix everything up. My appendix had ruptured and poisoned me and my body was slowly succumbing to sepsis. If it hadn't been for the amazing doctors who saved my life, I would have died. The reason my body started to feel less pain that night my appendix ruptured was that the pus finally had opened and started to release, and the buildup of inflammation was gone. However, my body was dying slowly to sepsis. If I hadn't called the emergency services, I wouldn't have made it. When I told everyone in the hospital about my experience, they all believed me. Apparently, it's not unusual for dying patients to have visitors or visitors to take them with them to the afterlife. I never believed in such stories until I experienced it myself. After all this happened, I started having mad astral projections when I lay in bed. I began to see after my near-death experience, something strange started happening too. I began to see things that I'd never seen before. I would lay in bed and have these projections and things that would usually be invisible to me were there. It was as if a veil had been lifted from my eyes, allowing me to see beyond what's normally perceivable by humans. At first, I was scared and confused by these visions. I didn't know what to make of them or what they meant, but as time went on, I began to realize that they were becoming more and more realistic. I would hear whispers in specific locations, and my dreams completely changed. They were no longer filled with monsters or unrealistic beings, but instead, they were almost like visions of real-life events that would come true. I would share some of these visions with my boyfriend, who happens to be a physicist, he was fascinated by them. I began to theorize that my near-death experience might have changed something within my brain's neurons, allowing me to perceive things beyond what's normally possible. But while my boyfriend was intrigued with my newfound abilities, others were not so accepting. When I shared my vision with my friends, they were terrified and they didn't want to hear about them at all. They would tell me not to tell them what I dreamt of, and they just wanted normal conversation instead. I felt horrible because at first I was excited when something I saw would come true, but now it's causing fear and anxiety in people around me. For example, I prophesied that my best friend's husband would cheat on her and never come back, and he did. And he came back for two weeks and acted like he loved her before leaving her and filing for, filing for divorce. My friend was understandably angry with me, and it stained our relationship. However, I was also having visions that saved lives. I saw my mother's face completely disfigured in my dream, and she was in tremendous pain. I called her in the morning and asked to go see the doctor. They found a huge abscess hidden in her lower jaw. If it hadn't been for that call, the infection could have traveled up to her brain or her bloodstream, potentially causing death. As time went on, I began to wonder if there is a way to turn off these strange visions. I didn't ask for them, and they were causing more harm than good just wanted my life to be back the way it was before. But as far as I knew, there was no way to deactivate them. I was stuck with these abilities, and they were changing my life in ways that I couldn't have predicted. Welcome to Paranormal M, where we delve into the darkest corners of the supernatural. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to stay up to date with our latest eerie tales. We hope you have a hauntingly good time listening. Shadow Figure in My Parents' Basement In 2005 and 2006, I was just 16 or 17 years old, living in my parents' basement, and I had recently started dating a girl who claimed to have the ability to communicate with spirits. Initially, I was skeptical of her abilities, but being a teenage boy, I was more attracted to her than concerned about her claims. One day after coming back from a soccer game, I went downstairs to find everything pulled out from under our staircase in the laundry room. When I asked my dad what had happened, he told me that the cats had been going under the stairs instead of using the litter box, so he had to clean it up. I helped him out a little bit before heading to my room to take a shower. My girlfriend was coming over, so I wanted to freshen up. About ten minutes into my shower, I started hearing loud and aggressive banging on the door. Bang, 
bang, bang. I assumed it was my dad needing something from me. So I shouted back, one second, dad, I'm just in the shower. But the banging continued, bang, bang, bang. I was getting a little bit annoyed now and shouted, Jesus Christ, I'm in the shower, give me a minute. But the banging persisted. And this time I was furious, so I grabbed a towel and stormed over to the door and flung it open saying, Kay, what do you want? I'm taking a shower. And to my surprise, no one was there. I was weirded out at this point and chills ran down my spine. The basement always creeped me out, so I poked my head out and looked to the other side of the basement, thinking maybe my dad stormed off or something like that. And then I saw it. A black figure standing there, as if I had caught him off guard. It had no eyes, no mouth, just a figure looking at me. We stared at each other for a second or two, and then it moved across the hallway towards the laundry room. I slammed the door shut and I started hyperventilating. What was I going to do? I had to pass the laundry room to get upstairs. I quickly got dressed and gingerly opened my door to look on the other side of the basement, but there was nothing there. No sign of the figure. I tiptoed towards the other side of the basement until I could see the stairs and then ran up. The first thing I did was call out to my dad, but my mom answered, saying that he was in the garage. I ran to the garage and asked my dad if he had been banging on my bedroom door. He looked at me confused in hell and said, no, why? I didn't know what to say. I was in shock. If that thing could physically hit my door, what else could it be capable of? As I sat there in the garage with a blank look on my face, I heard the dog start barking inside. That's when I realized that my girlfriend had pulled up outside. So I ran out to the front door to meet her, trying to play everything off as normal. But as soon as she walked in, she had a worried look on her face and asked, what did you do? Confused, I asked her what she meant, and she said, you've changed something about the house. Whatever you've changed, you need to change it back right now. I explained to her that my dad had just cleaned up a mess that the cats had made underneath the stairs, and we had to pull everything out. She told me to put everything back the way it was, so I hurriedly put everything back underneath the stairs in the laundry room, as it was before. I couldn't help but feel a little bit unnerved by her demand but I tried to shake it off as her just being superstitious. After all, she's the one who claimed to communicate with spirits, not me. My girlfriend and I spent the evening watching movies and hanging out in my room, and I tried my best to forget about the strange incident earlier. But as the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I kept hearing strange noises coming from the laundry room, and shuffling sounds, as if something was moving around down there. Every time I heard a noise, I would tense up, my heart racing in my chest. I finally mustered up the courage to investigate, grabbing a flashlight from my room and cautiously making my way down the stairs. As I approached the laundry room, the shuffling sounds grew louder and more frenzied, and I could hear what sounded like faint whispers. My heart was pounding in my chest as I slowly pushed open the door and shone my flashlight around the room. At first, I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. But as I swept the beam of light around, I caught a glimpse of something moving in the corner of my eye. When I turned to focus on it, I saw the same black figure from earlier, standing in the corner of the room. Its featureless face turned toward me. I froze, my mind racing as I tried to make sense of what was happening. But before I could take a step toward the figure, it vanished into thin air, leaving me alone in the silent laundry room. I stood there for what felt like an eternity, my heart still racing, trying to come to grips with what I had just witnessed. Eventually, I managed to gather my wits and make my way back to my room, where I spent the rest of the night tossing and turning, unable to shake the feeling of unease that had settled over me. Over the past few weeks, I became increasingly paranoid and anxious. Every time I walked past the laundry room, I felt like I was being watched, like something was lurking just out of sight. I stopped sleeping well at night, too, plagued by nightmares and waking up in cold sweats. I even started avoiding spending time in my room altogether, spending as much time as possible at school or hanging out with friends. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to confide in my girlfriend about what had been happening. At first, she was skeptical, but when I told her about the figure I'd seen in the laundry room, her expression turned serious. She told me that she had sensed a dark presence in the house from the moment she came over, but that she had been trying to ignore it. Together, we decided to try to do something about it. We spent hours researching online, trying to find ways to cleanse the house of negative energies or spirits. 
We burned sage and candles, sprinkled salt around the perimeter of the house, and even tried to communicate with whatever entity might be haunting us. But no matter what we did, the feeling of unease persisted. In the end, we eventually moved out of the house and into an apartment together. It was a relief to finally leave the basement behind, but the experience had left its mark on me. I never forgot the feeling of dread that would wash over me every time I would think about the black figure in the laundry room, or the whispers I heard in the darkness. And even now, years later, I sometimes wonder if that entity is still there, waiting for someone else to stumble across it. Weird screeching in my house. I've been renting a house with my wife for around three years now. And I have to say, it's been a great experience. It's everything we ever wanted, a full house to ourselves, and we're loving it. Recently, I started a new job on night shift. I got home around 5.30 a.m., and my wife was fast asleep. I decided to unwind by playing some games on my PC. However, at around 5.45 a.m., I heard a loud screech through my headphones. I took them off and looked in my room, only to find my wife was awake with her three dogs all staring at me like they were wondering what the hell was that. I went downstairs to investigate, but I couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. I was kind of confused, but I decided to go to bed anyway. The next day, my wife got home from work and walked into the room looking worried. She said, I don't know how to tell you this, but that screech that happened a couple times when you weren't home. At this point, I was starting to feel a little bit worried. I was at work and my wife was at home alone. Should I be worried? Does the house make weird noises like this sometimes? What should I do? I decided to do some research and found out that a house can indeed make strange sounds, especially if it's an older house. Some of the sounds can be explained, such as creaky floorboards, expanding pipes, or even the wind blowing through the cracks in the walls. However, there are some sounds that can't be easily explained. For instance, the screeching noise my wife and I heard. Some people might dismiss it as a figment of our imagination, but I knew that it was real. I started to worry about my wife being home alone, so I decided to install a security system. I figured that this would give me a peace of mind, knowing that she was safe and secure. I also did some research on ghost sightings, just in case there was something paranormal going on in her house. But I didn't find anything that could explain the screeching noise. Over the next few weeks, I kept hearing a strange noise in the house. It was starting to drive me crazy, and I felt like I was going to lose my mind. I couldn't concentrate on anything, and I was always on edge. My wife didn't seem to hear the noises, and I was starting to wonder if I was going insane. One night, I decided to set up a camera in the living room to see if I could catch anything on film. I turned off all the lights, and I went to bed, leaving the camera running. And the next morning, I woke up, and I checked the footage. To my surprise, I saw something moving in the living room. It was a shadowy figure, and it seemed to be moving toward the camera. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I showed the footage to my wife, and she was just as shocked as I was. We decided to call a paranormal investigator to see if they could help us, and the investigator came over and did some tests, and they concluded that her house was indeed haunted by a spirit. They told us that that spirit wasn't harmful, and it was just passing through. We were relieved to hear this, but at the same time, we were still a little scared. We decided to leave the spirit alone and coexist with it. We got used to the occasional noises and strange occurrences, and we even started to feel like the spirit was a part of our family. Overall, the experience was a little unnerving, but we learned to live with it. The Board of Truth As a child, I'd experienced a few strange occurrences that were also witnessed by my mother. Those experiences made me realize that there are some truths to the paranormal world. However, I never thought that I would personally have any experience with the supernatural until I became an adult. About four years ago, I experienced something that changed my life forever. First, I was excited about what had happened, but then, like the flip of a switch, everything turned dark, very dark. 
I was curious and I wanted answers. So I began investigating my own experience, doing everything I could think of, including things I'd seen on TV. Looking back, I now know that it was a huge mistake, but at the time I was trying to get answers and I was willing to do anything, even something that I'd always sworn that I would never do, attempt to use a spirit board. I did all of my investigating alone, which again, another mistake. I would go to the cemetery where it all started by myself at all hours of the night. And one day I got the bright idea of downloading a spirit board app on my phone. The first time I used it, I got just what I expected, garbage. But I didn't give up. After several attempts, I made one more, and this time, things were different. I was sitting at my kitchen table, turned on the app, and started asking questions. The answers were coming back quickly and accurately, and I thought to myself, wow, this time it's working. But I was still skeptical and thought to myself, I'm going to debunk this thing and bust it as a fake. I asked the spirit board if it could see me, and the answer was yes. I then asked for its name, and it responded with Maria. I asked where I was sitting, and it correctly answered kitchen table. I then asked what I was wearing, and then it answered correctly. Asked it where it was, and it replied with, next door in the cellar. Feeling confident that I had the spirit board app figured out, I asked it where it was located, and I asked, Oh, so you're in the red brick one story next door then? The spirit replied with a firm, No. So I asked, Which house are you in then? The answer made my blood run cold. The spirit replied with, Gray two story on the corner abandoned. When I looked out my kitchen window, there was indeed a gray two story house on the corner of another street. It had been abandoned for several years and had a cellar, not a basement. I continued to have conversations with Maria through the spirit board app for several months. One night, I started at 1 in the morning, and I didn't stop until about 7 a.m. It only felt like 20 minutes had gone by, but Maria could tell me things about myself that nobody else would know about. It would tell me about calls I had responded to years ago as a police officer and what I had seen or felt. My haunting became very horrifying for several years, and I still deal with it daily and nightly. An investigation was done at my house, and they got the name Maria as well. They said that Maria was actually a succubus that was attached to me. I stopped using the spirit board app a long time ago, but I'm still dealing with the very real issue of using one and not closing the door when done, using it by myself, and so on. I'm here to tell you that just because you use a spirit board and have no issues, it doesn't mean that your time isn't coming, and when it does, I feel sorry for what you may be dealing with. Please use spirit boards with extreme caution and never use them alone. The experience I had with Maria has left me with a deep understanding of the paranormal world and a newfound respect for its power. I've learned that spirits can attach themselves to us and we need to take precautions to protect ourselves. Since my experience with Maria, I've sought the help of paranormal investigators, psychics, and other professionals in the field. They've helped me understand what I went through and how to protect myself in the future. I've also done a lot of research on the subject, reading books and articles and attending seminars and conferences. My experience has become mostly a passion, and I now use my knowledge to help others who are going through similar experiences. I've also learned the importance of keeping an open mind when it comes to the paranormal. People may dismiss the idea of spirits and ghosts, but the experience has shown me that they are very real, and I've come to believe that there is much more to this world than what we can see, touch, and hear. In conclusion, my experience with Maria and the Spirit Board app has left a lasting impact on my life. It taught me to respect the power of the paranormal world and to be cautious when dealing with it. I hope that my story will serve as a cautionary tale for anyone who's considering using a spirit board. Always use them with extreme caution and never use them alone. And remember, once you open the door to the spirit world, it can be difficult to close it again.
Ask Reddit One. I used to live in what I'd like to call a half house, with the address of 118001 half. It was basically a shack remodeled to be a house. Let me explain the layout. The front door led to the small kitchen with a window that faced the driveway. The opposite, the window, was a half wall to separate the living room, which we used as a bedroom. The actual bedroom was always freezing cold and super tiny. It was just off the living room and the bathroom. The bedroom was connected to what everyone would call the garage, which only had two access points. One from the bedroom and one from the outside by the driveway, just a few feet away from the kitchen window. I've always been a crazy insomniac, so one night while my boyfriend was passed out drunk to my left and our kid was to my right, I found myself lying in bed staring at the ceiling. Suddenly, I started hearing footsteps on the roof, loud footsteps. But despite the flimsy material, it never shook our house. Our house was long, not big, but long. But whoever this was managed to run across the entire roof, down the long way, in just a handful of steps. But they always managed to stop just above our heads. I added this to my telling of creepy crap that happened in that house to my boyfriend's family when we spent time with them on the weekends. However, my boyfriend always blew me off, and no one believed my stories. After months of this, my boyfriend finally got tired of my stories and decided to prove me wrong. I told him that he couldn't get drunk and that I'd wake him up when the stomping started. He agreed to have no drinks that night. Well, the stomping started and I woke him up. He heard the stomping. He jumped up, threw his work boots on, in his boxers, and took my giant Rambo knife with him. And he ran outside. I locked the door behind him and waited and listened. Then I heard the stomping run from the living room across the house to the driveway. Our driveway had rocks, those stupid white rocks that my boyfriend thought looked nice, all the way up and down the driveway, so when you walk on them it has a very distinct sound. The thing got to the kitchen side of the house, jumped off the roof, and I heard those rocks just outside the kitchen window. I was too chicken to peek through the blinds, though. A few minutes later, my boyfriend came inside and said he didn't see anything except a cat. The cat was doing that thing he does when he wants to be petted more. The thing he does after someone's been petting him but stopped before he wanted them to. I told him the thing ran across and jumped into the driveway, that I heard the rocks, I never heard the stomping again, but other crazy shit started happening. His family finally believed me after that. After that night, I became obsessed with the paranormal. I started doing research and reading books and attending seminars and conferences. I wanted to understand what was happening to me and my family. I even reached out to paranormal investigators and psychics for help. They confirmed my suspicions that her house was indeed haunted. I learned that her house was built on Native American land and there had been several tragic events that occurred in the area. I also learned that spirits can attach themselves to people and that we need to take precautions to protect ourselves. I started taking steps to protect myself and my family, including smudging the house and wearing protective stones. In conclusion, my experience with the stomping on the roof in her half house was just the beginning of my journey into the paranormal world. It taught me that we should always keep an open mind to the unknown and the unseen, we should also be respectful to the spirits and entities that might be sharing our space. My experience showed me that sometimes it takes a while for others to believe you, especially when it comes to the paranormal. But it's important to keep speaking up and sharing your experiences because it may help others who are going through something similar. I am grateful for my experiences in the half house because it led me to a path of understanding and acceptance. I've become a believer in the paranormal and use my knowledge and experiences to help others who may be experiencing similar situations. I've also learned the importance of protecting ourselves from unwanted entities and keeping our energy fields clear and balanced. In conclusion, our half house may have been small and humble, but it opened up a world of possibilities and experiences for me. It taught me to always trust my instincts, to speak up even when others don't believe you, and to be respectful of the unknown. I'll always be grateful for that old creaky house and the stomping on the roof that started it all.
Ask Reddit 2. When I took my showers, I heard a lot of talking coming from various voices. It was hard for me to fully understand what they were saying, but I heard them calling out my name. It was strange because most people in my life only knew me by my nickname, which I've had for almost my entire life. Even my boyfriend and his family thought that my nickname was my real name. So when I heard my real name being called out, I answered back, calling out to them. After I responded, their conversation would continue, and at first, I thought it was just my imagination, but it kept happening. I would rush out of the shower, but it was just like my child and I inside, with all the doors and windows still locked. As I mentioned earlier, the house I was living in had been converted from something else. The house heater was located in the corner of the bathroom in plain sight without any kind of cover or door to hide it. Because of this, the pilot light would sometimes go out, and I'd have to light it by myself. The last time I had to relight the pilot light, I noticed something strange. There were names written all over the instruction sticker, in a childish cursive and in pencil. One of the names on there was mine, which was odd because I'd never seen those names before. Not in any of the times that I'd gone to light the pilot light before. I asked my boyfriend's cousin who knew about the history of the house, and he knew who the previous occupants were, and if their names matched the ones on the water heater. He said that none of the names matched, which only added to the mystery. My birthday was coming up, and it just so happened to be on the same day as my boyfriend's extended family member's birthday, who was home from the Navy. A big party was being planned and everyone was getting ready. My boyfriend's cousin came over to my house and asked to use my shower because he's worried that he wouldn't get hot at his shower at his house next door. I knew that his family was very strict, so I decided to go to the family's house next door while he showered, just to avoid any potential issues. While I was at the family's house, the cousin finished his shower and came back to my house. He told me that I didn't have to mess with him and asked me why I kept calling his name and knocking on the window. I was confused and told him that I'd been at the family's house the whole time, sitting on his mom's couch. He questioned his mom in Spanish, and she confirmed what I had said. I asked him what happened, and he told me that someone kept talking from just outside the bathroom door and calling his name. And when he yelled back, no one would answer him. But the talking just kept going. It was all very unsettling, and we never did find out who or what was behind it all. Experiences from working in a real haunted building. Let me tell you about the time I worked at a haunted house in my hometown during October. It was an old building that was built back in 1916, and was originally a hotel. Over the years, it had changed hands several times, and it was a hospital and an apartment building at different points in time, among other things. The building had been abandoned for a while but every few years someone would try to raise money and do something with it. Eventually, a local high school drama teacher bought it and turned it into a haunted house experience. I was initially brought in to be a substitute actor, but ended up getting a position because the girl who worked in the room before me refused to work alone. At first, she tried to stop people from telling me why, but eventually I found out that she had been scratched up pretty badly by something or someone while standing alone in the shower in the room. She still worked there, but just refused to be alone. As soon as I stepped into the room, I could feel a bad vibe. It was an unsettling feeling that would make me hate being there alone every night. The second thing I noticed was a rocking horse in the corner of the room. It was hanging in the corner, but it would rock all the time. I wasn't pushing it or anything. There wasn't any particular breeze. It just rocked continuously. The next thing that caught my attention was a super loud sound of running water behind me all the time. The pipes in the building didn't work at all, so water shouldn't have been going through them. It also wasn't raining or anything. I never figured out what that sound was, but it was there every night. Another strange occurrence that happened quite frequently was our technology stopped working a lot. Our lights and sounds that we used for the performance would randomly stop working all the time. But it wasn't a total power outage or anything like that. 
It was just like strobe lights or speakers that would shut down. There were a few nights when I took my phone out of the box where all the actors put their phones and my phone would go all wacky. I don't remember all the details as it's been years at this point, but when I turned on my phone, it was some sort of black-blue screen with colored or white text that covered the entire screen. It was weird that it only ever happened in that building. Despite all the creepy things that happened, though, I loved working there. The thrill of scaring people and the adrenaline rush that would come with it, unmatched. I guess it's true what they say. Some people just love the thrill of the unknown, and I'm definitely one of them. I just want to understand it. When I was younger, I lived in a house that was very active with paranormal things. There were many different experiences that people shared about my house, but my experience was a little bit different. It first happened when I was around eight years old. I slept with my sister a lot because I was scared to be alone, and I was sleeping and I had this horrible dream, but it was weird. It was kind of like sleep paralysis, except I couldn't open my eyes, so everything was dark. During this, there was a deep pressure on my chest as if someone was sitting on it. I literally couldn't breathe. It was like something was holding me down and I couldn't move or scream. My sister shook me until I woke up because I was breathing funny, quote unquote. This continued to happen and happened more and more frequently. It was horrible and I couldn't understand what was happening. It felt like something was attacking me in my sleep. I would wake up gasping for air with my heart pounding and I was too scared to tell my parents because I didn't want to be seen as weak or crazy. Instead, I suffered in silence and tried to find ways to cope with the terrifying experience. As the months went by, the attacks became more frequent and intense. It was like someone or something was trying to suffocate me. I couldn't escape the feeling of being held down and being unable to breathe. I was terrified to fall asleep, and I'd often stay up until the early hours of the morning just to avoid the attack. It was affecting my life, and I felt like I was losing control. Eventually, my family moved to a different house, and the attack stopped. It was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders, and I could finally breathe again. I tried to put the experience behind me and move on with my life, but the memory of those terrifying nights stayed with me. Years later, I still wonder what could have caused those attacks. Was it a spirit or an entity that was haunting the house? Or was it just a strange medical condition that I was experiencing? I've done a lot of research on the subject, reading books and articles and attending seminars and conferences. And I've learned that sleep paralysis is a pretty common experience. But the added pressure on my chest is not. It could be possible that it was a spirit trying to communicate with me or even harm me. But I'm not really so sure. And looking back, I realized that maybe I should have been more worried about my experiences. I should have talked to someone about it and sought help. I was too afraid to share what was happening to me, and it took a toll on my mental and physical health. It's essential to take care of ourselves, and that includes seeking help when we need it. In conclusion, my experience with the attacks of my childhood was pretty traumatic. It left me with many questions and a deep curiosity about the paranormal world. It taught me that it's okay to ask for help and that we should never be afraid to share our experiences. I hope that my story will serve as a reminder to others that there's always help available and we should never suffer in silence. Human-shaped brown smoke. In 2020, I discovered that I had cancer. It was a difficult time for me, and I had to undergo surgery, chemotherapy, and other treatments for several months. But I was relieved when I finally finished my treatment in 2021. One day while I was taking a bath, I felt something strange. It turned out that the surgery site had ruptured after five months and it was oozing pus and blood. I was filled with despair and didn't know what to do. I was afraid to start treatment again, thinking that maybe the cancer had come back with a vengeance. At the time, my father owned a quarry that was located about eight kilometers away from the city. It was a beautiful place surrounded by woods and with some family farms nearby. 
I decided to go there to clear my head and think about what to do next. The quarry had an open mine that was about 120 meters in diameter and 20 meters deep. There used to be a crushing plant located there, exactly where the trucks unloaded to the grinder. To take advantage of the force of gravity, it was located on the slope of the ravine about 30 or 40 meters high. From there, I could see an incredible view of the horizon. I parked my truck at the crushing plant and lay on top of it to watch the shooting stars. I don't know exactly how many hours passed, but it must have been something like midnight when I heard footsteps slowly coming towards me. I was armed with a pistol, but I had left it inside the truck, and all I had was a piece of wood lying there at the time. I was scared of being a criminal because we had problems with thieves, trying to maybe steal machine parts or other items like that in the area. But the footsteps seemed to come from the side of the cliff, which was impossible for anyone to climb. I even went back there to check it later. My second thought is that it was a jaguar. And because I'd been lying down for some period of time, whether it was a jaguar or a criminal, it might have thought that I'd fallen asleep. And as the steps got closer, I deduced that the figure was already on my side. I looked without moving my head and didn't see anything that was the height of a person. So I jumped with a piece of wood and screamed because, you know, it had to be an animal. Then I saw something that I'd never seen anything like before. I got goosebumps just writing about it. A human figure, completely dark brown, and it had no eyes, no mouth, and no ears. It looked like thick smoke, and it walked very clumsily, as if twisting. When I jumped, it still hadn't finished climbing. I froze, and it finished the climb. It passed by my side about a meter away from me. I deduced that it was just my... Maybe my height, I guess, 1.90 meters or less. When I jumped up and screamed, it did absolutely nothing. It passed by me and followed the opposite path I took when I got there. Left the road and entered the forest. At that moment, I took the gun from inside the car. It walked for a while and came out again in the clear and started coming towards me. The night was very clear with an almost full moon. When it got in a safe distance, as it came toward me, I started shooting. I shot 10 times, and I remembered that I still had 12 rounds, because I fired a few shots when I arrived. I landed all the shots as it approached, but it didn't do anything. It didn't seem to hit anything. At that distance, I never missed. However, it stopped and went back into the bush. For the rest of the night, I remained on high alert, watching and listening for any signs of the strange figure that had appeared before me couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled deep within me. Every rustle of leaves and snapping of twigs sent my heart racing with fear. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't explain what I had seen. The figure had moved like no human or animal I'd ever encountered. Its complete lack of features, save for its shape and color, left me feeling deeply unsettled. As the hours wore on, I tried to calm myself down by focusing on other things. I thought about my cancer, about how far I had come since my diagnosis, and how much more I had to live for. I thought about my family and friends and how much they meant to me, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had taken hold of me. Eventually, as dawn began to break, the figure disappeared back into the woods, its footsteps fading away into the distance. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief, but my sense of unease remained. I packed up my things and drove back to the city, still shaken by what I had experienced. Over the next few days, I tried to make sense of what had happened. I spoke to my father about the strange figure, but he refused to say much, only warning me to be careful if I ever went back to the quarry at night. I searched online for any accounts of similar sightings, but found nothing that matched what I had seen. In the end, I had to accept that what I had encountered might never be explained. But despite the fear and uncertainty that it brought me, it also reminded me of how precious life is and how much we have to cherish and protect it. Unexplained fingerprints appearing in my girlfriend's mirror. Let me tell you about the strange occurrences happening in my girlfriend's place. 
She's always been afraid of the paranormal, and I'm always teasing her about it. We've been together for over a year now, and about four months ago, her ceiling fell above her head. It was pretty scary, and it left a dark stain on the ceiling, indicating some sort of water damage. I kept joking that we should do a Ouija board session at her place, but she refused, understandably so. Lately, my girlfriend's been getting increasingly worried about something else. She's been asking me if I've been leaving fingerprints on her massive mirror, which measures about 8 feet by 5 feet. I have not, and I've been teasing her about it, thinking it's just a silly joke. However, she's been very serious about it, fearing that it might be something supernatural. We've been cleaning the mirror thoroughly, but the fingerprints keep appearing, and today there were even more than before. I took some photographs of the fingerprints, and they're clearly fingerprints of a small child, about three feet up from the floor. The strange thing is, is that my girlfriend doesn't have any kids, so it's a bit eerie. To make matters worse, we once went to an old antique store near her place to buy each other creepy and old photos. We found some original photos from the mid-1800s, and I gave her one of a child. It's just a strange coincidence, but it's been making my girlfriend even more scared. I keep teasing her about the fact that her place might be haunted, but deep down I'm starting to wonder if there is something else going on here. The strange fingerprints on the mirror and the creepy antique photo are giving me the chills. Maybe it's time to take her fears seriously and do some investigating. Shadow People Experience Recently, my wife and nine-year-old daughter and I went on vacation to Northeast Georgia, where we stayed at a cabin. While I was excited to spend some quality time with my family, the trip turned out to be a nightmare. Throughout the entire week, I slept poorly and kept having horrible nightmares. It was unusual for me since I rarely remember dreams, but these nightmares lingered on, haunting me day and night. I started to wonder if the process of weaning myself off Celexa was to blame but for my restless sleep. However, what happened next changed everything. One night while trying to fall asleep, I saw something that shook me to my core. I looked toward the door in the hall and saw a figure that was darker than the rest of the room with no lights on. The figure seemed to be disproportionately large, but with no features. It was as if the darkness was taking a shape in front of my eyes. After I saw it, the figure either crouched, and disappeared, or sunk into the floor. It was a terrifying experience, and I couldn't explain what I had just seen. The following night was far worse as far as not feeling rested, and the worst dreams. I was completely exhausted due to the lack of good sleep, and I'm fairly open or sensitive to spirits, but I hadn't sensed anything ghostly in the house before this incident. But now, I was... Not only exhausted by lack of good sleep, but also freaked out. I started to question the safety of the cabin, wondering if there was something ominous lurking in the shadows. My wife mostly ended up sleeping in with our kiddo because she's afraid of the new place. But the few nights that she did sleep in the master bedroom with me, she also had disturbing nightmares and poor sleep. We both couldn't shake off the feeling of unease and terror that had engulfed us since our arrival. We had never experienced anything like this before, and it was starting to take a toll on our mental and physical health. We did some research on our own and found that many people have had similar experiences with shadow figures. These shadow figures are believed to be ghosts or entities that take the form of shadows. They are often associated with negative energies and feelings of dread. Although we were not entirely sure what we had seen, the possibility of encountering an entity or ghost in the cabin was pretty much overwhelming. In conclusion, our trip to northeast Georgia turned out to be a nightmare. Unlike other vacations that we had taken before, the shadow figure that I had saw was not only terrifying, but it also left me with a lot of questions. We're still unsure of what we encountered in that cabin, but we know that it had a profound effect on our well-being. We learned that the paranormal world is real and shouldn't be taken lightly. We hope that our experience will serve as a cautionary tale for others and urge everyone to approach such situations with caution and care.
our voices. I've never really believed in the paranormal until this started happening to me and my brother. We keep hearing our names being yelled at us in our own voices, and it's freaking us out. The weirdest part is, is that it only happens in one place and always at night. We've tried to ignore it, but we can't deny that it's real. The strange occurrences always start with a knocking or banging sound, and then we hear our names being called. It's always behind us, and we never see anything there. It's like someone or something is following us around, but we can't see them. The most unsettling part is that when it speaks to me, my brother can't hear it, and when it speaks to him, I can't hear it. It's like it's only targeting one of us at a time. And what's even more disturbing is that it uses my brother's voice to yell at me and my voice to yell at him. It's like it's mocking us or trying to scare us. We've tried to rationalize it and find a logical explanation, but we can't. It only happens in one place and it's always the same pattern. We're starting to wonder if it's some kind of ghost or spirit trying to communicate with us. But why would it only say our names in the other person's voice? And why only one word? At first we were really scared and would run away whenever we heard names being called like that, but now it's happening so many times that we're just like, what the fuck again? Shit. And we go home. We still don't know what's causing it, but we're hoping to find some answers soon. Never going back in. When I was a teenager, my family and I lived in eastern Kentucky, in the heart of the Appalachian Hills. Our small town was so remote that everyone lived miles apart from each other, and as a result, we often found ourselves searching for ways to entertain ourselves, like going ghost hunting or having sleepovers at friends' houses or parties in the woods. And one summer night when I was 17 years old, our group of three guys and three girls decided to visit an abandoned church that the guys had heard about. We set out in the car, but one of our friends wasn't able to join us. Since we had no service to tell him that we were, we were headed on our phones, it was just the five of us in the car. No service. The abandoned church was located in a hollow, far from town, up the hill. We had to turn right off the main road, and then drove for about 45 minutes down a one-lane street that curved over creeks and hills until it got extremely narrow and rural. The guys told us that once we got over a specific hill, we would start feeling odd, like someone was with us. It was also probably around 12 a.m. or 1 by the time it started. The area was hot and humid since it was in the middle of July, and we were in the car laughing and looking around as our driver took us over the creek and through the woods. After about 30 minutes, we made it to that hill that they had mentioned, and the car came to a stop in the middle of the road. The guys turned off the lights, and we watched and waited, but nothing really happened. This disappointed me, as I wanted to see something crazy, like lights or a demon standing in front of us or something. We decided to keep going to the church after a couple of minutes of silence and darkness. The guys were telling us about the last time that they had stopped in that spot. Apparently, they had a big commotion, and they thought that it would recreate itself in the present. So, we drove about 10 or 15 minutes more down this tight road between the mountains. Finally, slowing, slowing down around a curve, the hills opened up into a clearing with tall, tall grass. It was probably around one or two acres. In the far left of the property was a two-story stone building that was clearly a church. Sitting in the dark, I couldn't stop staring at it. There were trailers in the next field with lights and cars, so it wasn't 100% desolate. I was so excited to see something. I searched the windows, convincing my eyes that I might peep a little figure peeping through the darkness, but I saw nothing. We parked on this concrete lot area, right off the road and got out. The guys convinced us to hike through the grass to the building, and we went happily. The first story was the basement, and the second was the church itself. The guys led us up the steps that went to the second story through the front doors. I don't remember if we were inside or still standing outside, but our sixth friend pulled up about ten minutes after us. He said that he couldn't get a hold of us since there was no service anywhere. He said someone wrote the initials of the street of the church and it was located in the dirt of his car window and decided to see, and luckily, his hunch was right. 
We all went inside at this point. This was a Southern Baptist type of church, and the sanctuary had all the windows broken out. There was a raised stage area where the preacher probably stood with a podium. The pews were all gone, so it was an open room with a black corner closet in the left of the stage, and a small door and a small door to the right of the stage, which led to the basement. The guys decided to venture down there alone, while the three of us girls stayed upstairs and do some ghost hunting. Armed with our phones as recording devices, we asked the usual questions like, what's your name and who are you? But there was nothing, just silence in response. As I sat on the stage, closer to the closet in the corner, I began to feel a sense of cockiness wash over me, which was not my usual demeanor. I couldn't explain why I was feeling that way, but I knew better than to challenge something I didn't understand, and I said, I don't believe anything is here. Why don't you knock on something, make a sound, do something? Then we heard a knock. My friend warned me, it's going to follow you home if you don't be careful. But I brushed her off. Suddenly, the closet next to me started making subtle sounds as the dead leaves inside shuffled quietly. The three of us huddled together, bracing ourselves for what was going to come. We then heard footsteps from the front doorway to the church, and then from the closet. A cold wind, and the footsteps from the door started running towards us, progressively getting louder with each stomp. All three of us began to scream as the guys ran upstairs to meet us. I don't know why we didn't just run out of the building, but eventually we regrouped and made our way back to the car. One of the guys said that he heard a choir of people singing from downstairs, and one of the girls claimed to have heard a piano while they were regrouping. The next night, I was safe in my room sound asleep. I had a dream that a huge black figure with claws came through our closed front door. It stomped up the steps the same way that we had heard in the church, and it entered my room. It slammed my door open, shoving the doorknob into the wall and causing damage. It came up to me asleep and unable to wake, and it shoved me out of my bed. I woke up on the floor with the door embedded into the wall. It was my first sleep paralysis dream. Since then, I've had similar dreams of this figure finding me, standing and staring at me, shoving its hand into my body and dragging out my organs. All while I couldn't move or scream, it's been years, and these dreams are not as common anymore. I never went back into that building because I truly believed whatever was there followed me home. Of course, we went back to the church constantly and it became popular, but I would wait in my car and whoever's vehicle took us each time. I've seen friends go back in and run, children chasing them in the grass, even when they didn't have kids with the group. I've seen eyes in the rearview mirror while leaving the hollow. I've even felt my long hair being pulled in the car while I waited, and even while I was sitting at home after visiting. I've had paralysis dreams since then, and I believe it was whenever I was in that church the first time that this all started. I'll never go back there ever again. Has anyone else seen spirits or ghosts on a war battlefield? Whenever I visit Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a Civil War hotspot, I always encounter strange sightings of spirits or ghosts, or whatever you want to call them. The first time I went, I stayed in a pre-Civil War house and saw something in my doorway. It was black and had red eyes, which was incredibly strange because I don't experience sleep paralysis. The next night, I saw a little girl playing with toys on the carpet in the children's room where I was staying. The next time I went to Gettysburg, I stayed in a renovated car shop that once belonged to a baseball player. However, every night at 3.11, I would wake up to a glowing figure holding a baseball bat. It was so vivid and surreal, I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that it gave me. On my third visit to Gettysburg, I saw soldiers walking through the fields as we were driving in at night. It was a strange and eerie sight, and I couldn't help but feel unsettled throughout the trip. Thankfully, we only stayed for three days, and as soon as we left the town, I felt fine again. But I can't help but wonder if anyone else has experienced similar encounters in Gettysburg. The sightings I had were so vivid and lifelike that it's hard to dismiss them as being coincidences. 
It's like the place is a magnet for paranormal activity. Every time I visit, I'm bound to see or experience something bizarre. The scratching sound in storage space. I recently moved into a new house, and my room is in the finished attic. I love my room because of the cozy feeling that it gives me, and the view of the neighborhood is fantastic from up here. There are two tunnel-like storage spaces on either side of the attic that my family uses regularly, and the other day while I was working on my laptop, I heard a sort of scratching or dragging noise coming from one of those storage areas. Initially, I thought it was a mouse or a rat that had snuck up into the storage area, so I decided to investigate and looked around, but there was nothing to be found, no nesting or droppings or anything. I brushed it off as my imagination playing tricks on me, and I went back to work. However, two days ago, I heard the same noise again, and this time, I was sure that it was coming from the same storage area. I gathered my courage and went to check again. Still, nothing out of the ordinary was strange and inexplicable. I'm a total skeptic, I guess you would say, and I don't believe in ghosts or paranormal activities, but this event really freaked me out. I was concerned about what could be causing the sound. My house was only built about 20 years ago, and there have never been any deaths or accidents here, so what could it be? I tried to convince myself that it must have been something rational, but... Maybe it was a faulty pipe, or maybe it was the wind making noise, but deep down I couldn't shake the feeling that something else was going on here. I started paying more attention to the storage area specifically, and I noticed something strange. There was a cold spot in that area where I heard the noise. It was weird because the temperature in the rest of the attic was the same. I started to think that maybe there was a draft in the storage area, but when I tried to locate the source of the cold, I couldn't find anything. I even went as far as to ask my family members if they had heard anything strange in the attic, but they say that they hadn't heard anything. It was as if I was the only one hearing this noise. I couldn't get it out of my mind, and the more I thought about it, the more scared I became. I couldn't concentrate on anything else, and I started to feel paranoid. I was worried that something bad might happen, and I wouldn't be able to explain it. The more I thought about it, the more I became convinced that it was something paranormal. Maybe it was a ghost or a poltergeist that was haunting my attic. I knew that it sounded silly, but I couldn't think of any other explanation, and in the end, I decided to move to my bed to the other side of the room, as far away from that storage area as possible. I also made sure to keep my door locked at all times, and I still hear the noise every now and then, but I try to ignore it and tell myself that it's nothing to worry about. Despite my efforts to rationalize the situation, there's a part of me that still wonders... What's causing this noise? I don't think I'll ever truly know, but I've learned to live with it. I'm just glad that whatever it is, it hasn't harmed me in any way. The Haunting of a Hotel I'm an avid traveler, and I've been staying at numerous hotels, but none of them have left me with feeling shaken or terrified as my last experience at a hotel in Istanbul. Let me take you through my unforgettable and bone-chilling experience. It was a beautiful day when I arrived in Istanbul, Turkey. I checked into a hotel, a charming boutique hotel located in the city's historic district, the hotel was housed in a century-old building with a rich history, and I was immediately captivated by its old-world charm. The hotel staff was friendly and the atmosphere was welcoming. Little did I know that I was about to encounter something far beyond my imagination. On my first night, I started experiencing strange things. At first, it was just small things like faucets in my bathroom turning on by themselves, objects moving inexplicably, and eerie whispers echoing through the halls late at night. I brushed them off as my imagination playing tricks on me, but as the days went on, the encounters intensified. One night, I woke up to the sensation of someone sitting on the edge of my bed, but when I looked around, there was no one there. Another night, I heard footsteps pacing outside my door, but when I opened it, the hallway was empty. I 
couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched and the air in the hotel seemed to be constantly charged with an otherworldly energy. As I ventured deeper into the hotel, I discovered that this hotel had a dark past. It was said to be built on an ancient burial ground. The locals whispered of a tragic incident that occurred there years ago. Legend had that it was a family that was brutally murdered in the hotel and their spirits still haunted the premises. Determined to uncover the truth, I delved into the hotel's history and discovered chilling details. There were reports of unexplained deaths, strange occurrences, and guests who had checked out abruptly, unable to bear the paranormal activity present there. The hotel staff seemed to be tight-lipped about the incidents, but their nervous glances spoke volumes. As my stay continued, the encounters grew more intense. I heard disembodied voices whispering my name, saw shadows darting in and out of the corners, and witnessed objects moving on their own. The atmosphere in the hotel became suffocating, and I found it hard to sleep or even feel at ease. One fateful night as I lay in bed, I saw a figure standing at the foot of my bed, staring at me with empty eyes. My heart pounding in my chest as I tried to scream, but my voice was silenced. The figure disappeared before my eyes, but the terror remained. With my nerves frayed and my sanity questioned, I decided to check out of that hotel the next day, desperate to escape the malevolent presence that had tormented me throughout my stay. As I left the hotel, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something had followed me out, a cold presence lingering on my shoulder. I shared my bone-chilling experience with a few Turkish friends, warning others about the haunted hotel. I was shocked when others shared their encounters and experiences at the hotel. Some claimed to have had pretty much the same story that I had, while others vowed to never stay there again. To this day, I can't explain the inexplicable events that occurred at the hotel, but I am certain that I encountered something beyond the realms of the natural world. My story serves as a cautionary tale for those who dare to stay at that hotel, a place where the veil between the living and the dead seems to be disturbingly thin. Greetings, fellow adventurers of the unknown. Join us here at Paranormal M as we uncover the most mysterious and perplexing stories. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications to never miss out on our latest unexplainable tales. We hope you enjoy the journey. Imaginary Friends When I was one or two years old, my family temporarily moved into an unfinished house. I don't remember much about it, but my mom and sister told me about it. Years later, anyway. Apparently, it was a house that a family friend owned, and we moved in there on a whim after my parents were evicted from our old house because of some office drama. My dad's boss blamed him or something, and he didn't do directly for some reason, and ever since, we were renting out the lot from him, and we had to leave. The new house was generally unsafe, with deep cracks in the road and no street lamps. This meant that no cars would be passing by, but it also meant that the neighborhood kids would be playing in the empty lots in the area, including the one that we were living in. The lot area was huge, so there was plenty of space for them to run around. And for some reason, I became consistently sick since we moved there. My parents didn't have much money, as my dad was just a rank-and-file minimum wage earner with three kids, but somehow they always managed to pay for my hospital bills. I must have been getting sick from the lack of clean water and electricity, but my parents never really talked about it. During the day, my parents and I were rarely home. My dad was at work and my mom and I were at the hospital. Only my older siblings, who were five and eight years old, would be left at home managing the store that my mom had set up after we moved in. At night, my older sibling would tell my parents about some kids that would be pranking them. They would hear voices of kids pretending to buy something, but... When they would come to the store, no one would be there. There were also times when the neighborhood kids would stand in front of their door wearing horn-like sticks on their heads, and whenever they would check, the kids would be gone. As for me, I would cry and say, there's a moo moo. Moo moo means ghost or monster, anything unnatural and scary for the kids, while pointing at the ceilingless roof. This had been going on for two months and everyone thought I was dying because I was consistently dehydrated, barely ate anything and I would only play outside when there were no kids around. 
There was a mango tree on the property that I would climb, and I would shout, hey friends, to no one in particular. My family thought I was losing my mind, and one day the tree was filled with honey that the neighborhood's kids had collected in empty glasses. Another day, the entire lot area of the house was filled with white flowers. My mom said it took her days to clean it because it was really thick, about a foot. It also smelled really good. My sister told me that flowers, these particular flowers, looked like frangipani flowers, kalachuchi in our language. My parents are massive skeptics and dismiss these things as anything but natural occurrences, though they really don't have any explanation about it other than you know, the honey, and why they would be bothering to do it. My pediatrician at the time told them that it's normal to have an imaginary friend at my age, so they just went on with their lives. That is, until my grandma visited us and was shocked at how many changes I had gone in, in over just two months. She scolded my mom about not taking my health seriously, despite her bringing me to the hospital every single day. My grandma told my mom that my disease, which the doctors at the time couldn't really figure out the cause, aside from the lack of running water, could be caused by supernatural entities. Considering the honey and the flowers, which my grandma thought to be gifts from the spiritual world, my parents were skeptical, but they were trying to try anything that would help me feel better. They brought me to a, they brought me to a witch doctor, a faith healer, who gave me the most sticky massage I've ever had in my life. I can still weirdly remember it, focusing on my forehead. I'm not sure what happened next, but I remember this old lady handling melted candle wax at my mom with what looked like woods. I don't remember anything else, but my sister told me that they've been seeing something which resembles a woman with long hair, triangular nose, and whiskers. She said that it really looked like a cat. The old lady, the faith healer, said that this cat-like figure wants to get me, and that's why they're giving me this disease. Shortly after that, we left that house and lived in a much better area. One of my godparents heard about what had happened to me and had their old house rented out to us. 26 years later, my mom and sister would be telling me this story, only that my older sister remembers a friend that had passed away. My sister described the kid pretty well, and then she was tall, blonde hair, white skin, and always wearing a white dress, but in her undies. My sister also told my mom that she doesn't know where this kid lives. Now my mom, though mostly not at home, knows the neighborhood kids because she's friends with their parents, even after we left the area, and she said that it's impossible for her to miss that kid because she would always be seeing them playing at her house, but my mom doesn't know the kid. My sister, who knows where all of her friends live, also doesn't remember where this kid that passed away lived. She said she's always just seen her in one of the empty lots in the area. I don't remember anyone else playing with her other than her. Doesn't know how she passed away, but she said it must have heard it from someone else or someone who had heard it from them. The weird thing about the two month stay in the house is that I can clearly remember the hospital visits and the massage, but not the house or the friends. I only remember playing once outside the house, picking some red flowers and calling some kids by their names, which my sister and mom know, and nothing else. When we moved out, my older sibling would scare me about the cat-like entity whenever I'm playing with cats. And we didn't own any cats prior to moving into that house, but I insisted to have one once we moved out. I can remember my mom and older brother always throwing these cats out of the house. I loved them so much, but they felt creeped out with how much I loved them. I refused to play with other kids unless they were involved. I can still remember this, and I loved hearing them breathing despite not having any idea about deaths. I always played alone, but I was happy as long as my cats were with me. I still have cats, and they're more scaredy cats than me. I had a dream my dad committed suicide. When I was just a kid, my dad passed away. It was a really hard time for me, as I was only eight years old, and I remember my mom telling me that I had gotten really sick, and that's how he died. Of course, at the time, I didn't really understand the gravity of what had happened. I was just sad that my dad was gone. But then something really strange happened. A few weeks after my dad's death, I had this incredibly vivid dream. And in the dream, I was just laying in my bed, 
playing my Nintendo DS like I always did. And suddenly my dad just burst into the room. I was so surprised to see him that I jumped up from the bed and asked him what was wrong. But he just completely ignored me as if I wasn't even there. My dad started going through my dresser and grabbing clothes and underwear. I was really confused about what he was doing, but he didn't say anything. Then he tied all the clothes and underwear together until he made a noose. I was getting really scared at this point, but I still didn't say anything. My dad then hung himself from my window with the noose that he made. I started to panic and kept trying to say I'm sorry and I love you, but he just kept ignoring me. It was like I wasn't even there. The dream was so vivid and real that I woke up in a cold sweat. I was so shaken by what had just happened and what I experienced. Years went by and I never really talked about the dream to anybody. But then one day my friend told me something that shocked me. She said that my dad actually died by hanging himself while he was on a job trip in Ohio. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know what to say. I decided to confront my mom about it and I was really angry. I demanded to know why she had lied to me about my dad's death. She confirmed that it was true, that my dad had actually hung himself. She said that she had only told me that he was sick because I was too young to understand. It was a really difficult time for me. I couldn't believe that my dad had done something like that. And the fact that I had a vivid dream about him hanging himself before I even knew how he died was just too much to handle. But eventually I learned to cope with it. I talked to a therapist and I found ways to deal with my grief. And now, even though it's been so many years since my dad's death, I still think about him every day. My sister and I had the same dream about the both of us being victims of an attempted abduction. As I recall, the dream occurred on different days, but the memory of it still lingers in my mind vividly. It was the day when our mother took my sister and me to the grocery store for our weekly shopping. I noticed that two tall men in black were following us. Their presence sent shivers down my spine, and I couldn't shake off the feeling that something terrible was going to happen. I couldn't remember their faces, but I knew that they had a sinister agenda. As they were checking out, my mother realized that she had left her wallet in the car. My sister and I offered to go get it for her. As we were waiting for the checkout line, it was taking forever. And as we walked toward the car, I saw the reflection of one of the men reaching into his pocket for a cloth, which I assumed to be chloroform. Panic set in and my sister and I ran into a nearby nail salon, frantically asking people inside to call the police. The next few moments were a blur, as we could hear the men barging into the salon and dragging us out. We were helpless and the police never came. The dream ended abruptly, leaving us both feeling uneasy and unsettled. My sister and I recalled this dream multiple times over the years. Perhaps it's a sign of our fate or a message from our subconscious minds. I can only hope that if such a situation ever arises in real life, we would have the strength and courage to overcome it. Caught what was possibly a cryptid, attempting to enter my home uninvited. About a year ago during the summer, something really creepy happened to me. I was living in a house that had one acre of land surrounding it, and it was located near farmland. One morning I woke up in my living room couch around 8 in the morning, having fallen asleep the previous night along with my mother and sister who were sleeping beside me. I had planned to watch a movie that I hadn't finished the previous night on my laptop and eat breakfast in the dining room of my house. I sat down at the end of the dining room table, which was the closest chair to the kitchen. If I leaned back in my chair, I could see into the farther side of the kitchen where the door that led into the deck was, which was a huge window next to it. So I turned on my movie and started to eat my breakfast as my dog trotted over to me and sat next to me. I think I was about 45 minutes into the movie when my dog suddenly switched spots, now sitting right under the archway that led into the kitchen, staring at something. I felt her move but didn't really think anything of it. If it was serious, she would have been barking like crazy. About 10 or 20 minutes later I glanced over at the dog and noticed she was still staring at something, and this time I heard shuffling and scratching over in the kitchen. I called out her name but she didn't move. 
when I walked over to investigate. I followed her trail of vision and noticed that she was staring at the window in the kitchen that leads to the deck of the house. I nearly shit myself when I saw something or somebody behind the window outside peeping through the blinds. I forgot to mention that there was a chair on the deck right under that specific window. So whatever the hell that was had to have been balancing on the chair to look inside. It looked bald almost and was white with a pinkish tone. It had been holding into the window frame, peering at my dog and me while scratching the screen on the window with this horrible heavy breathing. I remember thinking in the moment that it was a person trying to break in because whatever he was, he wanted to get in desperately. The thing was sort of small and seemed as if it didn't want me to see the rest of its face, only its eyes. The whole time my dog had been watching whatever this thing was and not barking. I'm saying this because something as simple as dropping a cup will send my dog into a fit, barking like crazy. Even a voice coming from TV would, maybe a couple minutes of barking would come from her after that. As I said, I believed someone was trying to get in, so I ran over to the couch in the living room, shaking my mother awake and bringing her to the kitchen. And of course, whatever the hell it was had simply disappeared. I would have thought I was losing my mind if my dog hadn't seen the same thing as me. I peered out another window, checking the driveway in case it was a person who had driven a car here, but there was nothing of the sort. My mother went out into the deck and looked around, but there was nothing except for fingerprints on the window frame. We checked around the whole yard and found nothing except the prints. I'm still traumatized to this day, knowing that whatever that was was watching me for quite a while and I didn't know. And also, the fact that if it was a person, it would take a while to get off the land, even if they tried running away. We would have caught them. There's a huge yard. Giant chicken prints in the snow. When I was around 17 or 18 years old, back in 2011 and 2012, something really strange happened to me and my friends. It was the kind of thing that you never forget no matter how many years go by. It all started with my buddy, who lived a few blocks away from me, stole a rosary off a headstone at a cemetery. I know it sounds really bad, but we were just dumb kids at the time. Now let me tell you about this cemetery. It's an old cemetery where the founders of the town are buried. And connected to the cemetery is an old farmhouse. The whole area is definitely haunted. We would always shortcut through it to get to our neighborhood even though we knew it was a really bad idea. But we were young and dumb, and we thought it was exciting to go through there. So, on this particular night, I wasn't with my friend when he took the rosary, but I met up with him at his house later that night. We were all just hanging out on the couch when his phone rang. His phone was on the coffee table next to the rosary, and the caller ID read unavailable, misspelled and all. The number that showed on the phone was 666-666-6666. We all got spooked. I told him to answer it, but he didn't. We all just sat there feeling uneasy. After a while, I decided to go home for the night. And this all happened during the three days, a year, three days a year, that we have snow or ice in Texas. It was already really creepy, and the weather just added to the eerie feeling in the air. The next day we met up again, and I shit you not, there were these giant chicken prints that came from the creek that we had to cross over between our neighborhood and the cemetery, going right up to the window of his room where we were all hanging out the night before. These prints were bigger than my hand and had three toes facing forward and another small one facing backwards, identical to a chicken, just much bigger. We were all really freaked out. It was like something out of a horror movie. What's also weird is that the tracks just ended at the window. There were no tracks leaving the window. It was like whatever made those prints just appeared out of nowhere and disappeared the same way. We never did find out what happened that night, but I know that I'll never forget it. Even now, years later, whenever I think about it, I get chills down my spine. It was like we were being watched by something, something that we couldn't see or understand. And even though I'm older now, I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural, but I can't help but wonder what really happened. I 
I think I saw a ghost as a kid. Let me share with you a bit of background about my childhood. I lived in a shithole apartment located in the ghetto parts of the city, where shootouts were a common occurrence. The apartment floor had a corridor that led to the front door, which opened into the kitchen. On the left-hand side, there was a bathroom, followed by my sister's and my room, while on the right-hand side, there was the living room, the back door, and my brother's room. It was a small apartment, and my sister and I had to share a bed, while my other sister slept in the same room. I was around 8 or 10 years old when one night during autumn or winter, me and my two older sisters were in bed. All the lights were out, and I was bored, so I looked around the room, I blinked, and suddenly there was a figure in front of me. I think it was a female figure, as it had long, dark, wavy hair. I didn't feel scared or tired, and in a blink of an eye, she was gone. It was a strange experience, but I brushed it off and went back to sleep. A year passed, and my sister and I were playing around the apartment building having fun, and my older sister saw some kind of blue figure of energy in one of the hallways that I was running through. She shrugged it off, but as we went back into our apartment, she froze at the corridor that connects to the living room. When I sat on the couch and asked her what was wrong, she said that she saw someone's foot with a blue dress walking in the house and heard someone standing on the floor, creaking it. It was the same one from inside the apartment. And to be honest, I never really felt a negative energy with her at all. She never really bothered us except for really freaking out my sister once. We never saw or heard anything like that again, but I think she left us alone. Looking back at my childhood, it's surreal to think that we had to live in such a dangerous and eerie environment. Nonetheless, these experiences have shaped me into the person I am today, and I'm grateful for that. My childhood home was haunted. When I was growing up, my sister and her friend were really into playing with Ouija boards. They were around 11 or 12 years old at the time, and would often play in our bathroom. What's strange is, is that they didn't even have a real board. They had drawn one on a sheet of paper. But despite this, the board seemed to work, according to what I heard with them. My mom had told me that the two young boys and an older lady had died in our home, which was pretty old. I don't know if it's true, but if it is, then maybe our home is more sensitive to this kind of game. I decided to join my sister and her friend once, but I immediately got bad vibes and said screw it, and I wasn't down for it again. However, they continued to play. My sister had mentioned that they were trying to contact her friend's uncle who had recently passed away. I don't remember the answers they got, but I do remember them saying that the glass started moving. They were really excited about this and continued to play even though they didn't know what they were doing. But the scariest thing that happened during one of their Ouija board sessions in her old apartment bathroom was when they had lit some candles, those small round ones, maybe around eight of them, and all of them blew out at the same time. My sister said that they panicked and quickly said goodbye, and they never played with the board again. However, I always felt like they had invited something into our home. Years later, for no reason at all, I woke up one night and saw a face in my bedroom, down in the basement. I can't say for sure if it was related to the Ouija games, but it definitely left me feeling uneasy. My house is haunted. When I was eight years old, my family moved into a house that seemed like a normal house at first but there was something about it that felt eerily familiar to me. Despite having never set foot in that house before, I knew where everything was and everything felt super familiar. A few months after moving in, I started having recurring dreams of me wandering around the house. Although these dreams probably don't mean anything, they felt so real that I would wake up feeling like I had spent hours wandering around the house. And in these dreams, I never felt alone. Whenever I turned my head... I would see something peeking at me. The dreams eventually stopped, but I always felt like I wasn't alone in a room. My dogs would bark at corners in the house, and my older sister claimed to feel something living in her room. For a while, nothing really happened, until a couple years ago, when I was 13. I began hearing whispering whenever I was alone in the house, and I started seeing shadows when no one was around. Objects like balls would roll on their own, 
and although I initially thought it was just the wind moving them, my dogs would bark at something next to the ball. Other objects would also be in different places than where I left them, like stuffed animals or the TV remote. I even heard running and footsteps at times, always running to my location in the house. Despite my attempts to tell my family about all the strange occurrences, only my older sister believed me. Although the stuff that I was seeing never happened to her, she could feel a presence in her room at times, but one of the weirdest things happened when I moved into the room downstairs. The room in our basement is the biggest room in our house, and since I'm the last kid living at home, my parents decided to give it to me. There's a back door down there that connects to the dog area that I keep locked because it makes me feel safe, and sometimes I'll exit through that door to pick up dog poop or something different, and most of the time I'll lock the door back up, but I've forgotten to do so about a dozen times. When I forget to lock the door, I'm getting ready to go to sleep. I'll hear this sort of tapping. And the tapping only happens when the door is unlocked. At first, the tapping sounds like it's outside, but when I get up to go to the door to investigate, it sounds like the tapping is coming from somewhere else. When I lock the door, the tapping stops immediately. I don't know if this is something like a reminder telling me to lock the door or something else entirely. Most of this stuff happens when I'm alone. It happens to me. And if I am with someone and I hear whispers or footsteps, no one else can hear it, just me. I know if this is a friendly ghost or something malicious, but it hasn't hurt anyone yet. However, if it's targeting me, since I'm the only one who here who happens to be able to hear it and interact with it, maybe something else is going on that's definitely something that concerns me deeply. To add to the mystery, this house is fairly new, and has only had one other family living in it before us but no one in that family died. My sister says it could be a ghost of my biological dad. I was adopted and he passed away when I was a baby, but I don't think it's him. Nonetheless, I can't shake off the feeling that there's something supernatural going on in my house. A symbol appeared to me after brief contact with an invisible entity. I've always been a skeptic in my life. I never believed in anything beyond logical explanation. But last night something happened to me that I can't explain logically. Maybe there is a logical explanation, and I really hope there is, because it would be so much easier for me to accept than what I really think happened. Maybe I'm just crazy and going out of my mind, and but what happened yesterday... Could have been a hallucination. It would be reassuring to know that it was. But as I think about it, a fear too great to be a product of a broken down mind overwhelms me. It's the knowledge that what I saw with my own eyes is real that terrifies me so much. Let me start from the beginning. I was lying in my bed in that transition phase between wakefulness and sleep. Best time to hallucinate, you'd think. And that's exactly what I thought too. But then it happened. I felt something moving underneath my sheet. But I didn't bother to look because I thought it was just a sensation induced by my imagination. However, the sheet moved again, and this time with more force. And in that moment, I understood that something was actually moving. But I thought it was just the fabric that was sticking to my bed, and maybe it was falling and generated movement. So I straightened out the sheet and went back to sleep. But another motion followed. I was surprised, but the thought again that it was the fabric falling off, so I fixed it better, tucking it underneath my legs to prevent it from falling out again. Only that the sheet kept moving. The sheet moved as if something underneath tried to lift it, like a cat that curls up underneath the covers but then tries to get out. Too bad that I didn't have a cat, not anymore, so that motion appeared inexplicable to me. I thought maybe I was lucid dreaming or it was sleep paralysis. But I had those experiences before, and it couldn't be the same. I was there awake, and I could move. I could scream. I could look at the clock and count how many fingers on my hand I had. And that's exactly what I did. I tried to reestablish contact with reality to understand if all this was a result of my imagination. It wasn't. The sheet moved again. It began to rise, as if there was someone underneath it, outlining a shape. Not the shape of a person, but that of a sphere as if there was an invisible ball underneath the sheet that rose above my legs. I began to feel an indescribable fear, 
The whole episode lasted, at most, a handful of seconds, but they seemed like minutes to me. I'd never experienced anything like this in my life. I had some near-death experiences, in which I felt immense terror, but nothing compared to how I felt when I understood the irrationality of that phenomenon. But it wasn't just that. I perceived evil coming from that orb, if we can call it that. I felt like that it was a positive entity, and that it wanted to hurt me. I don't know how to explain it. Nothing in this story anyway at all I don't know how to explain. So in fear's grip, the only thing that came to my mind was to tell that thing not to hurt me, and the reaction that the orb had was something inconceivable. The terror that I felt when I saw the sheet shake violently as if this thing actually tried to communicate its hostile intentions to me. It's hard to understand. It was as if it tried to tell me, yes, I'm here to hurt you. And in that moment, fear took over me, knocking me unconscious. Or at least, that's what I think and I hope happened. When I woke up, I felt a sharp pain in my head. It was pounding like when you drink too much and have a hangover. I tried to remember what had happened the previous night, but my mind was too foggy. As I slowly sat up in bed, I realized that something wasn't right. My head was still throbbing, and I had a strange sensation on the sides of them. I tried to shake off the feeling, thinking that maybe I slept in a strange position, and that's what was causing the pain. But as I got out of bed and walked around, I realized that the pain wasn't going away. It was as if someone was hammering inside of my skull. I couldn't understand what was happening to me. I hadn't drunk alcohol, I hadn't eaten anything heavy, and I hadn't taken any drugs. The only thing I had taken was some butocyanide for my asthma, but that had never caused any side effects before. As I walked around the room trying to make sense of the pain, I noticed something strange. When I closed my eyes, I saw a drawing imprinted on the back of my eyelids. It was a mark, a strange symbol, with the letter V, and a cross placed at its vertex. I rubbed my eyes, hoping to make the drawing go away, but it remained there, as if it was imprinted inside of my head. I've never seen anything like it before, and I couldn't understand what it meant. I decided to recreate the mark with paint, hoping that someone could help me understand what it meant. I felt a sense of fear as if something was not right, and I couldn't shake off the feeling that it was demonic in origin. In a panic, I started to pray. I've never been a religious person, but in that moment, I felt that the only thing that could really help me was to pray, and as I prayed, the mark on the back of my eyelids began to disappear, and the pain in my head slowly subsided. I felt a sense of relief, as if someone had lifted this particular pain and weight off of my shoulders, but at the same time, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something strange had happened to me. I was left with only fear and the doubt that it was all the result of a hallucination. I know it sounds crazy and I wish it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, but deep down, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something else was at play, something that I couldn't explain logically. I've been haunted by something for seven years. For the past seven or eight years, I've been tormented by something unexplainable. It all began in 2015, when my electronic devices started malfunctioning without any reasonable explanation. As time passed, the situation grew worse, and by 2018, I began to experience horrifying things like sleep paralysis and bruises all over my body, and even night terrors. These experiences were so terrifying that I ended up attempting suicide and had to be hospitalized. During this time, I started seeing white glowing eyes in the dark, which was the most obscure experience I ever had. I also heard whispers at night, sometimes jumbled voices whispering together or just my name being called out. The most bizarre and terrifying part of my experience was when my skin color started changing to gray, sometimes even a dark gray color on my hands. No explanation was ever given for this strange phenomenon. As if this wasn't enough, things got even worse in 2019. I woke up one morning with cuts on my arms and face. Not scratches, but cuts. This experience was incredibly frightening and confusing, as I couldn't think of any possible explanation for it. After the incident, the torment stopped for about three years, and I began to believe that it was all over. However, just three weeks ago, it started again, and this time, it's worse than ever. 
I've been experiencing blackouts and I don't remember most things that happened during those periods. Bruises have returned on my legs and I've been having trouble sleeping at night. I've gone to doctors and psychologists, but none of them have been able to offer any logical explanation for what's happening to me. I'm at my wit's end. and That's why I've decided to turn to Reddit for help. If anyone has any suggestion or has experienced anything similar, I beg you to share your knowledge with me. I can't keep on living like this and I need to find a way to make it stop. My mom kept whispering my name in a phone call that she says never happened. I still remember the incident that happened in 2013 when I was only 12 years old. I was home alone and sitting on my computer when something strange and inexplicable occurred. Let me take you back in time and share my experience. As a child, I was always afraid of being alone at home, especially after watching horror movies with my older brothers. So whenever I was home alone, I would open every door in the house and let the sunlight in, feel, less, feel a little bit less scared. That day was no exception. I was playing League of Legends on my computer when I heard her old landline phone ring. It was odd because my mom never called me at that hour. However, I picked up the phone and said hello. What happened next shook me to my core. I heard my mom's voice whispering my name in a few very low muttered tones in a low voice. And I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. I freaked out and started to say, Mom? But there was no reply, only dead silence. After a few seconds of terror, I hung up the phone and sat down crying while still playing on the computer. When my mom got home from work, she noticed that I was anxious and asked me if something had been upsetting me. I told her everything and asked why she pranked me by calling and whispering my name. She looked confused and said, I never called you, honey. We checked her phone and there was no outgoing call to our house's phone that day. My mind was racing with theories of what had just happened. Was it something supernatural or one of my brothers pranking me? I couldn't shake off the feeling that it was real. None of my brothers admitted to the prank, and they didn't know how to spoof a phone call, and to this day, my mom still swears that she never called me that day. She remembers being freaked out, though. After the incident, I was even more afraid of being home alone. I would always keep the doors and windows locked and have my phone nearby, just in case something strange happened again. I tried to rationalize the experience, but deep down I knew that there was something I couldn't explain here. It remains one of the most frightening moments of my life, and I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Finally feeling my grandfather's presence. Recently I experienced a painful loss in my life my beloved grandfather passing away. It's difficult for me to accept the fact that he's gone, and even though I'm sort of in denial, it's still a heartache that I can't seem to shake off. I can't even bring myself to say the word died. Perhaps it's because I can't come to terms with the fact that he's no longer with us, but maybe it's just my way of coping with the loss. In the past few days, I've been praying and begging for a sign from him. I'm not very religious, but I do believe in God and Jesus. I just needed some sort of connection with my grandfather to feel him around me somehow, and today, less than 30 minutes ago, I finally got my chance. I was sitting at my desk reading some articles and listening to music when I felt a poke on my side. It was a familiar feeling, one that I knew all too well. My grandfather used to do that to me all the time when he was still alive, poking me on the neck or on the side. It was our little thing, and now I felt the same sensation It froze me in my tracks. I paused the music and looked around, thinking that it might have been my mother trying to get my attention. But she was sitting on the couch to my right. She denied poking me or needing my attention at that moment. My niece and nephew were both sleeping in another room, and my cat wasn't even in the house. It was just my mother and I in the living room. This led me to only one theory, that it was my grandfather reaching out to me. I had begged and prayed for a sign for about a week now. I asked him to do something only he and I would know he'd do, and now I think he did. It was a very emotional moment for me, and I couldn't hold back the tears. It reopened a very fresh wound that had just barely started to heal, but I'm not upset that he made contact. I'm actually very happy about it. It's just the pain of losing him is still very raw, and it hurts so much. 
I stepped out of my comfort zone by sharing this story, but it was just too good not to share. To everyone reading this, please take note of what I'm saying. Hold your family close and love them. I know some of you might be thinking, of course I already do, but trust me, it will really sink in when they're gone. Family issues are common and some things might be unforgivable, but if it's something small enough to forgive, please do it. You don't want to leave things unsaid. My grandfather and I had a great relationship. In fact, he was more like a father to me than my grandfather. My grandparents divorced when I was 14. It was like my parents had split up, but they managed to keep a pretty great relationship. I think they needed time apart for a while. He lived in another house taking care of his mother and one of his two brothers. But he always came around and made sure that we were okay. The last time he came over to my house, I was sleeping. I thought I'd catch up with him later, but I regret that decision so much. I'll regret it for the rest of my life. My grandfather and I were really never once to express our loves for each other in words. We didn't need to. We just knew that we loved each other. But now, I wish that I had that chance. I wish I could hug him and tell him how much I loved him. But it's too late for that now. Losing someone close to you is never easy. It's been especially hard for me because my grandfather was more than just a family member. He was my father figure. He was always there for me, through thick and thin, and he never judged me for my mistakes. He loved me unconditionally, and I loved him just as much. Since he passed away, I've been struggling to come to terms with his absence. I miss him so much, and I've been praying every day for some sort of sign that he's still with me in some way. And today, I got that sign. I felt a poke on my side, and just like he used to do when he was alive. First, I thought that it might have been my mother, but she denied poking me. There is no sign in the room that there was anyone else there. That's when I realized that it must have been him. I know some people might think I'm crazy for believing in signs like that, but to me, it's more than just a coincidence. It's a message from someone I love and miss dearly. And even though it reopened a fresh wound, I'm grateful for the opportunity to feel his presence again. This experience has reminded me of the importance of family and how we should never take them for granted. Life is short. We never know what we might lose in someone that we might love. So, we should cherish the time that we have with them and never leave things unsaid. Even though my grandfather and I didn't say I love you to each other often, I know deep down that we both felt it. It's hard to express the depth of my grief, but writing about it here has been therapeutic for me. It's a reminder that I'm not alone in my pain, and there are others that maybe are going through similar experiences. Losing my grandfather has been one of the hardest things I've ever had to face, and I know that he's still with me in spirit, and that brings me comfort. To anyone else who might be going through something similar, I just want to say that it's okay to grieve, and it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling. We all cope with loss in different ways, and there's no right or wrong way to do it. Just remember to hold your loved ones close, and never let a day go by without telling them how much you care. My True Creepy Stories One night I was sitting at the dinner table, enjoying my meal while the lights were on. However, outside it was pitch black. As I looked up, something caught my eye. A white figure, almost glowing, was crouching underneath the window, and then began to walk. I couldn't tell if it was a person or something paranormal, but I vividly remember the entire figure was completely white. It sent shivers down my spine, and I was left wondering what it could have been. Another strange encounter I had was during the day. I was looking out the window and I saw a figure that resembled a scarecrow, but it was much taller than any normal scarecrow. It had to be at least 10 feet tall, and it was walking behind a fence. I couldn't make out much of its features, but I could tell that it was wearing a robe with a hood, and it had a skull face. It was a truly frightening sight, and I felt like I was in some kind of horror movie. Both of these are experiences that left me feeling uneasy and terrified. I couldn't explain what I saw or rationalize it in any way. I tried to tell my friends and family about what had happened, but no one believed me. I felt like I was going crazy, and these encounters continued to haunt me for a long time. Even today, I still wonder what those figures were and if they were trying to communicate with me in some way. Our house wasn't haunted, it was just visited. 
Growing up, I had the misfortune of living next door to an old cemetery in a small town. Even though the cemetery was very old, people were still being buried there. My family's experience living next to the cemetery were nothing short of strange and unexplainable. As my parents worked until 6 p.m., my brother and I would get off the school bus between 3 3 3.30 p.m. and would be home alone. Every day we'd get off the bus and wait until it left before casually walking into our house and going about our routines. However, some days we'd hear children's voices coming from our backyard, even though there were no other houses nearby with kids. Our house was surrounded by cornfields and the cemetery next door, which always made us feel uneasy and kind of nervous. My little brother would act like it didn't bother him, but I know he felt it too. We stopped checking the yard for children and just ran inside and after a while. It was just a strange occurrence that happened almost every afternoon. My brother's night terrors started getting worse. His screams would wake us all up at night in a panic, thinking someone was hurt or worse. One day I asked him if he remembered what he dreamt about, and he told me that he'd scream just so he could move, and he'd be paralyzed facing his closet, where his clothes would be turning into bodies hanging from nooses. It was always the same people just hanging there and looking at him. Another terror he had involved a man who would appear in his bedroom door, walk to the window across the room, stand there before slowly vanishing. The man would reappear at the door and continue this cycle until my brother would scream himself out of it. Years later, I recall coming home one night. My parents were out, and my brother had all the lights on in the house, the TV, music, everything. I found him on the floor, trembling and crying. After I calmed him down, he told me that there was something in the basement. I looked over and he had the door blocked with one of her dining room chairs. I told him to stay there and that I'd check it out. I moved the chair, opened the door, and looked down the stairs, and I saw it too. At the bottom of the stairs, there was what looked like a girl. She was on her hands and knees with her long hair covering her face. She was looking down at the floor, but facing the stairs. I was able to muster up a, who is that, or something like that, and her head flipped up, and I mean flipped. It was not a human movement and I didn't stand there long enough to get a good look at her face. I grabbed my brother and told him to get in my car. We left and didn't come home until we knew our parents were home. We never saw that one again, but she has stuck with me. There is so much more to this story, but who has the time to read all that? My brother's blocked out everything that happened, and he won't talk about her childhood ghosts with me anymore. It's almost as if he's trying to forget everything that we experienced living next to that cemetery. I learned later that the cemetery was having issues with new burials. The bodies would be shifting underground, and the maps that the town have are inaccurate. When they'd go to dig up a plot, sometimes there's already someone buried there. It's a chilling realization that our driveway sits right over the cemetery according to Google Maps. The experiences I had while growing up next to a cemetery had a profound impact on my life. Even after so many years have passed, I still can't forget the strange and unexplainable things that happened to me and my family. All these experiences have left a lasting impression on me, and I can't help but feel that they have influenced the person that I am today. Someone give me some insight here on a dream or not dream. I would love another perspective. My name is Nate and I work at a factory in Virginia that constantly hires temporary workers. I've met all kinds of people from different walks of life, but one particular couple caught my attention back in 2011 or 2012. Let's call them Ben and Lisa, both around 20 or 21 years old. They had just moved here from New York. Lisa had lived with her father her whole life and then decided to reach out to her mother online. They moved down to Virginia to meet her mother and leave behind some of the trouble that they had gotten into in New York. Interestingly enough, Lisa was a practicing witch and upon meeting her mother, found out that her mother and grandmother were also involved in witchcraft. As a Baptist minister, I always tried to bring up faith in conversations, not in an overly pushy way, but more of a general question. If they wanted to talk more about it, that was fine. If not, that was fine too. Ben was interested in my beliefs, and over the past few months, who worked with us, we had several conversations about our different beliefs and backgrounds. We became pretty good work friends. However, 
He used to work in another part of the factory where there was another lady who was practicing witch as well. Unfortunately, there was some bad blood between the two. This lady was someone that the wife grew up around, and although we knew her pretty well, we never fully trusted her. One night I was up late washing bottles for my baby son. I let my wife go to bed early and I stayed up and took care of the bottles and preparing things for the next day. I finished up at around 1am and went to bed. I was almost asleep when I felt something slide across the top of the blanket from my left foot across my body and come across the right side of my bed beside my head. I heard a voice ask, What if you looked over and your wife wasn't your wife but was Jane, the other witch lady at work? My response was a calm and peaceful, I would kill her. No idea why it was that extreme. In my sleep or not sleep, I reached out and grabbed whatever was there and tried to strangle it. Then the thought crossed my mind. You're killing your wife, dummy. I woke up and I was still lying on my stomach, but all the muscles were tense and I was gritting my teeth and feeling uneasy. My wife was still alive and sleeping peacefully beside me. I hadn't moved since I laid down. I shook it off and glanced at the clock. It was 1.30 a.m. and I had to get up soon for work, so I went back to an uneventful sleep. The next day at work, I saw Ben looking pretty rough, so I asked him if he was okay. He stopped and looked at me, waiting for some people to pass by, and told me that he hadn't got much sleep last night. I asked him if he was sick because he sounded pretty hoarse. He pulled down the collar of his coat and showed me his neck. He had a very deep purple bruising on his throat. I asked him what happened and he told me a story that sent shivers down my spine. I was asleep in bed, and something dragged me out of bed and tried to kill me last night. It was choking me to death, and while it was, my girlfriend said it was growling or something was growling in the room. There was a voice in my head that said I had one week to leave the house or it would kill me. Lisa ran and got her mom, and as she did, we let go. I remember the day that Ben shared that terrifying experience he and his girlfriend Lisa had gone through. It was a typical day at the factory and was going to lunch when I saw Ben looking disheveled and tired. I asked him if he was okay and he stopped and looked at me with a serious expression. He waited for some other people to pass by and told me that he hadn't gotten much sleep. I asked him if he was sick and he sounded hoarse, but I'm repeating myself because this was written by AI or something like that. Ben had been asleep in bed when something had dragged him out of bed and tried to choke him to death. He struggled as it squeezed his neck and he heard growling sounds coming from him or the room. Then he heard a voice in his head warning him that he had one more week to leave the house or would kill him. I asked him what time it was, and his answer stopped me in my tracks. It was about 1.30 in the morning, he said. I told him 1.30 in the morning I had been trying to kill something in my dream, or not dream, by choking it to death. We were both disturbed by the similarity of our experience and wondered what it could all mean. Later that day, we managed to find some time to piece together what was happening. Ben's girlfriend kept coming out and acting strangely, whispering in his ear and staring at me weirdly. I felt something evil standing right beside me and I became nauseous and chilled, and feverish at the same time. My palms were sweaty, which hardly ever happened to me. It felt wrong like something evil that did not like me was speaking to Ben. The next morning, while I was washing bottles in the kitchen, I had a visitor. In the dark kitchen, lit only by a crappy small fluorescent bulb, felt something slip up behind me, just like at work. The breath on my neck, the feverish chill, the sweaty palms, the nausea returned. I chucked the bottle in the sink and told the entity that it did not belong in my house, that it was a Christian home and that it had no place there. Then as calmly as I could, turned and walked as fast as I could into the bedroom without looking back. I said a prayer for Ben because the last time I felt that presence was when I talked to him, but I felt like he was in danger. I didn't know what had happened exactly, but I found out at work the next day that the previous night, around the same time, I had felt the entity in my kitchen. Ben had decided to convert to Christianity and said that whatever had been bothering him had left. I had no idea what any of this meant or what caused it. I had questions whether it was Ben's girlfriend and maybe she didn't like the influence I was having on him. Or if it was just the other girl that my wife knew trying to cause the two of them, Ben and Lisa, issues or something and I got dragged into the middle of it. All I know is that it was more than just a coincidence and whatever it was that caused it hasn't been back around since.
weird sighting just happened to me. It was a beautiful day, so I decided to spend some time outside reading. Our house is located near the woods, and there's a shed next to me at an angle while I look out over our yard and into the woods. As I was lost in my book, I heard a crunching noise coming from the woods. I assumed it could be a deer or a turkey, since they often come close to me when I'm still. I looked up to see what was making the noise, but to my surprise, it wasn't any of the usual suspects. Instead, I saw this strange, bizarre thing. I know this might sound vague, but it looked like a headless, naked torso, with just its arms dragging itself across the ground. There was no blood, and it was just injured. But the way it moved was so peculiar, it gave me goosebumps. It reminded me of those strange ocean sunfish. But this was eerily more human. I was terrified and had never seen anything like it before. I couldn't comprehend what it was, but I rushed inside to get my cousin to show them this bizarre creature. But by the time I returned outside, it had vanished into thin air. I was left wondering if what I had seen was some sort of paranormal thing. Was it a ghost or some strange creature? The whole incident gave me the creeps and stayed with me for a while. Strange encounter as a child. Help, maybe? When I was a child around 10 years old, I had an experience that I'll never forget. Even though it sounds weird and hard to explain. Only my dad believes me because he believes in the paranormal. I was playing in the woods beside my house when I tripped and fell over a root, rolling down a small embankment into the street. As I looked up, I saw a car coming around the bend. I thought that it was going to hit me. Then I saw this figure, made of glass, hovering over me. It was a man, but he was transparent, and I could see clean through him. He had an interesting look in his face, like he was examining me. Like when you see a penny on the sidewalk. I remember he was an older man with green and blue colors swirling around him. He looked like he was wearing a fur coat with one hand tucked into the front, and the other arm was kind of black and withered, like wood hanging down to the side without a sleeve. The clarity of the memory is still so uncanny to me to this day. It's like I can still see him with perfect clarity. He appeared to be a solid figure made of glass, and I don't know how to explain it. But it was like I could see through him and yet see him at the same time. It was so surreal. Suddenly, a branch fell from a tree, right on the hood of the car that was in front. And it caused the driver to brake. If it hadn't been for that branch falling, the car would have hit me. I looked back at the figure, but it was gone. I have no idea what that figure could have been. I don't even know if it was an entity or some sort of spirit. But I'm pretty sure that whatever he was, he saved my life. I've always wondered if that figure was some kind of entity or if anyone else had seen something like it. It's been bothering me for ages, and I've been researching paranormal stories trying to find something similar, but I've found nothing. That memory is still so vivid, and I don't know if it was a guardian angel a ghost or something else entirely. All I know is that it was a surreal experience and it changed my life forever.